Welcome. Uh, my name is Victor Quilio, and I am very happy to uh, to start this workshop, this webinar on performing Bach St. John Passion before the downbeat. Um, I'm the director of the Center for Early Music Studies at Boston University, and this was originally planned, as some of you know, um, as a live uh, workshop with participants. Uh, to we were trying to create an immersive two-day workshop for. Um, performers and uh, musicologists. And of course, once that became impossible, we looked at other ways of trying to um, deliver this, um, this topic. And uh, we're excited about this. This is our first webinar and we hope it won't be uh, the last and the first of, of many. So um, uh, this, since we're kind of kicking the tires um, <laughs> for this webinar the first time, uh, we, um, you know, we'll see what, uh, how it goes. We, you are in good shape, and we have very good support, and I look forward to a very, very interesting day. Um, the uh, webinar will be in uh, three sections, um, uh, pretty much organized by the panelists, um, Joshua Rifkin, uh, Daniel Malamed, and Ellen Exner. And we are, um, we will start with, with Joshua Rifkin, and then we will uh, proceed uh, to um, uh, Daniel Malamed, then we'll have a break. Uh, around 1.30, uh, and uh, maybe for about uh, 45 minutes to an hour. And during that time, uh, the uh, registrants can submit email questions um, and to our uh, email site, cems at bu.edu. And we can't promise that we're going to be answering all the questions, but we will try to scroll through them and, and either answer them in the context of the presentations or actually answer them directly as they're asked. But my, my sense is that a lot of your questions will be answered anyway as we proceed through, proceed through the day. Um, I'm very happy to, to introduce the, the three panelists, and I think I, I'll just say a few words about each one. Uh, Joshua Rifkin, of course, is a professor of music at Boston University and certainly one of the most eminent and influential scholars and performers um, in the world of the music of J.S. Bach, whose careful work on Bach sources has reshaped the way in which we hear, perform, and interpret Bach's music. Uh, the Bach Ensemble, which he founded in 1978, won Britain's Gramophone Award for its path-breaking recording, which I somehow just have right here on my desk, of, uh, of the Mass in B minor. <laughs> and his edition of the B minor Mass, published by Breitkopf, uh, presented the first critical text of this standard work. Most recently, he was named recipient of the European Prize for Church Music for 2020, joining a distinguished list of previous winners that includes um, that include Arvo Pert, uh, Sofia Gubaidalinas, Peter, Peter Schreier, Helmut Rilling, John Rutter, and Krzysztof Penderecki. The letter announcing the prize referred to his, quote, years-long outstanding engagement in the cause of sacred music as internationally renowned conductor, interpreter, and musicologist. And that award comes on the heels of Joshua's having been made an honorary member of the Royal Musical Association and the induction of his recording Piano Rags by Scott Joplin into the Grammy Hall of Fame. Daniel Malamed is professor of musicology at Indiana University and has taught at Yale University, the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill and Columbia University. He is the author of Hearing Bach's Passions and Listening to Bach, the Mass in B minor and the Christmas Oratorio both for general readers and of J.S. Bach and the German Motet. He's co-author of An Introduction to Bach Studies and the editor of the essay collections Bach Studies to and J.S. Bach and the Oratorio Tradition. He has published articles on J.S. Bach, The Bach Family, and Mozart Opera, and has edited musical works from the 17th and 18th centuries. He serves as president of the American Bach Society and director of the Bloomington Bach Cantata Project and plays bass, the most important to my eyes, in the 80s cover band called Don't Call Me Betty, and in the House Cats, an acoustic trio. Ellen Exner received her PhD in musicology at Harvard University and is a specialist in the music of the Bach family and Berlin during the reign of King, King Frederick II. She is also a full-time faculty member um, at the New England Conservatory of Music, the vice president of the American Bach Society, and a performer on Baroque and classical oboes. Her most recent publications cover topics as diverse as the dedication of Corelli's Opus 5 violin sonatas to Bach's role in the music of Parliament Funkadelic. 
At present, Exner is writing a book for Oxford University Press on Bach's St. Matthew Passion. I'd like to also to introduce our master of ceremonies, and that is, and the person who's really brought this all together, and that is Brett Kostreski. Kostreski, who is a PhD student in uh, musicology at Boston University. Um, Brett uh, is working on uh, aspects of 16th century polyphony, uh, and he is also a Bach specialist and a conductor and a singer. He is um, really, uh, we really thank him and are grateful to him to, for, for really envisioning how this works and for all of the, the excellent uh, work that he's put into it. And he will be taking over from here as we move through the day. So I'd like now to um, turn it over to, to Joshua Rifkin, who will begin with a, um, a, an introduction called From Source to Sound, The Preparation and Use. 1724 to 2020. Thank you. Thank you very much, Victor. Um, greetings to everyone out there whom I and we cannot see. Um, this is new to us, and this can be, I think, a bit disconcerting to know that there are, at least in principle, many of you out there. The enrollment for this has been um, impressive and gratifying. And we hope to be able to reach you and communicate you, with you um, even over this kind of distance created um, by the circumstances in which we are currently living. Before I get going, I'd like to uh, thank a couple of people. Victor, as I say, who really got this idea going, the Center for Early Music Studies, um, and also the present project. Um, my good friends, Dan Malamud and Ellen Exner, uh, as I say, good friends and distinguished scholars, um, and also people very, very close to the performance of this music. Uh, Dan, who has a conducting history, and Ellen, as you've heard, as a noblest who has no doubt actually kind of really had to take it on the chin in doing the actual work. You know, um, people like me can wave our arms about that the real job is done by people like Ellen. So I hope that she'll bring some of that experience into the discussion later. Um, thanks to Brett Kostevsky, of course, uh, without whom, as Victor says, this thing could not have been implemented um, as well as it seems to have been implemented. He's done a wonderful job for us. And also to Brian Masters, an eminence behind the scene, who has been sort of our guru on technical matters. Now, this whole enterprise, uh, which as you know, we're calling before the downbeat because we're not having the practical component that was foreseen, um, grew out of the most recent round of performances of the St. John Passion that I led with the wonderful Jerusalem Baroque Orchestra in Israel, in which I was giving quite a lot of downbeats, in fact. Um, and that experience made me think again about this piece. Uh, you hope to think again about any piece of music you're performing each time you do it. And it raised some questions in my mind, and I thought that I would like to explore them further and explore them with other musicians, as I say, with the workshop that we originally envisaged, which was also supposed, which was also planned from the start to have a scholarly component like this. And very early on, um, Dan and Ellen came into our sites as people to uh, bring into this project. Now, what I'm going to be speaking about here is uh, perhaps the first thing one is doing before the downbeat, that is, I'm going to be concentrated on the who, the question of who is performing, and particularly on your singers. Now, this kind of focus on Bach's scoring, I think needs to be understood in two ways. There is one part of it, which is, in a sense, the aesthetic implications of what Bach might have done and how this might relate to what he wanted, what we might want, etc. And I'll have to say that that is largely going to be excluded from what I'm talking about here, although I do hope that it will come up in the discussion session this afternoon. I think everybody um, should feel free to ask about, well, what does this actually mean to the music as we're doing it? But it also has a very practical side. Certainly, 
um, to anybody who works largely in the early, er, world of early music, which is essentially a freelance and gigging economy. So the first thing somebody in my position has to do is know whom are you going to call or whom are you going to email? Whom are you going to get on for this job? Um, so you obviously want to know, well, what kind of people are you going to want? It's not quite like where you, you know, go to a modern symphony orchestra to conduct a Beethoven symphony and there is their string section and there is their winds, etc. And that's all been set up and you just come in and you give your downbeats. Um, you have to do some uh, infrastructural planning before that, and that inevitably gets you into these questions of what Bach himself might have done on information we can get. So that is going to be really what I'm concerned with here. And I'm going to be particularly concerned, as you saw from the title of this, with Bach's performing parts. Um, as you know, you cannot perform ensemble music without parts. Uh, we think of a piece of music as really embodied in the score, but that's a very modern conception. And in older times, uh, people did not think that much of scores, except composers as a sort of means for working out the harmonies and all of that. But the real thing was performing music, and that meant, of course, something from which singers and players could read and sing and play. And those are, in a sense, the things really where um, how should we say it, the rubber hits the road. So we're going to look at Bach's vocal parts and a little bit of instrumental stuff to the St. John Passion. Now, at this moment, I shall attempt to um, get up a slide show. And I think there we are, except I want to get rid of a... Um, is anybody seeing a, a, a command bar at the top of this, or are you just seeing my example? Very good, okay. So we're going to take a look at the parts that we have, the vocal parts that we have first. Now, a couple of pref prefatory words about these parts. Those of you who have read Dan Malamid's discussion of this matter in his book, and of course I'm assuming that is everybody, will know what I'm about to say, but I think it's useful to say it again when one can actually see things in front of one. Um, singers did not in Bach's time sing from vocal scores or anything of the score. They sang just like instrumentalists from parts. Singers had their own parts with just their line. And you're looking at such a part that says soprano. You can see up in the left, Passio Christi Secundum Ioannum, uh, the Passion of Christ after St. John and Soprano. Um, you see, by the way, music crossed out. That, of course, is not how this part originally looked. As you have uh, discovered already, this piece of music went through quite a few performances and quite a few transmogrifications with these performances and involved swapping out movements. And here is a movement that was there. They didn't want it to be performed on occasion, so they cross it out. They replaced it with something else which you are not seeing at the moment. Um, the other, one other thing I should say about the parts also right away. There were two th well, first of all, what they contain. Basically, a part, let's say, that's called soprano contains everything in the soprano register in the piece. Choruses, chorales, recitatives, arias, anything else. It's all in there and all in sequence. Um, I won't bother you with little refinements of that at the moment. Equally important is what the parts don't contain. Now, if you look closely at that page, you will see that there are little measure numbers. Sort of like if you look at the second staff, you can see a little six above the staff, and then there's what, a seven, eight, 30, etc. None of that is real. None of that is from Bach's time. That's all modern stuff that was put in by a librarian, I guess, at some point. Indeed, Bach's parts do not contain measure numbers. They do not contain rehearsal letters like A, B, and C. 
And not only that, they do not contain movement numbers. Notice this is the first movement, but there is no number one. It also does not tell you what this movement is, whether it's a chorus, a chorale, an aria, or whatever. This is absolutely typical, both of Bach's parts and in fact for everyone's, everyone's performing parts until at least the end of the 18th century. This obviously has impl implications for how music might have been prepared, rehearsed, etc. We won't go into these here, but you might reflect on them a little bit. But there is one payoff for that in the parts. They actually put a high premium on indicating precisely what they do indicate. Because if you, they're very well set up for starting with the first note and just going straight through to the last note. As we see, they're not so well set up for starting and stopping and anything else that happens in the middle. But it is important that they get things right. That in other words, they tell you, you know, if you're not in this movement, if you're shutting up in a movement, that the movement is there and you know not to come in and sing in it. Well, we'll see how that plays out in practice in these parts to some extent. Now, let's see what we actually have. There are basically eight parts for the St. John Passion. And fundamentally, these eight parts are not only all we have, but all there ever were, all that Bach had. They fall into two groups. And these have a certain complication to them. Let me explain. The two groups are what we might call the parts. People sometimes call them these days principal parts, copied parts, but actually they were just called parts in those days. That's the default, as you see there, soprano. It's just a soprano. It doesn't say, is this a solo soprano? Is this a choral soprano? What is it? Just soprano. And that's a default part. Now, the parts that were written for the first performance of the St. John Passion in 1724 vanished quite early on in the game. It seems as if Bach lent them out to somebody and the next year he still hadn't got them back. Now, through a series of emergencies, it seems, into which we needn't go here, he wound up having to perform the St. John Passion again a year after its first performance. So he had to have a new set of parts copied out, um, certainly for the principal voices. And here you see one of them, soprano, and will the, let me see if I can advance this. Yes, here we have the um, alto. Here we have the tenor. And here we have the bass. So these are all from 1725, but they replaced lost parts from 24. As I say, you'll see music is crossed out here. You'll see it's crossed out and with a bracket um, on the upper left hand in the alto. Uh, there's a probably uh, a rubbed out bracket here in the tenor. This is because, as I say, this movement, which was entered for the second performance, the first performance of these parts, was later replaced. What was it replaced with? Well, this brings us to the remaining parts from the first performance. When Bach first performed the St. John Passion in 1724, he let it off with the movement that is familiar to most of us as the opening movement, the chorus Herr unser Herrscher. And there, in fact, you can see that in this part. <clears throat> This is one of four parts surviving from 1724. In a few corner, it's called soprano ripieno. And that is joined, well, it has a title page. It's joined by alto ripieno, tenore. Ah, but it is tenore ripieno because it's been added on a cover. And basso ripieno. If you look in the upper right-hand corner, by the way, the, the word ripieno seems to have been added by somebody else, probably J.S.B. himself. Now, what ripieno parts are, as the word suggests, sort of fill in or stuffing out, filling out, fleshing out. And they are parts that fundamentally double the regular parts, the main parts, the default parts. They double them, not in everything, but in 
and this is not surprising to people today, choruses, chorales, and a few other occasions. So you see here, in fact, um, the first chorus, Herr und Herrscher, in the basso piano part. That said, I will not talk much about the piano parts, but it's worth saying a further word about them, what they are and what they are not. As I say, what they are is they double. They are fundamentally secondary. What they are not is then primary. And indeed, we have these piano parts from 1724 precisely because they were not necessary. Everything that was necessary was contained in these parts. Those or their equivalents. Bach could send them off, but could keep these with him at home because somebody in another place didn't need them to do the performance. This has implications that are worth thinking about. What I'd like to stress here is that there is an occasional tendency to equate piano, the extra singers, with the modern chorus. We have our soloists, we have our chorus. This, let me say very quickly, is a misconception of how these things work in Bach's time, not just for Bach, really for everybody from 1600, even into the early 19th century, you still find this convention in Schubert. And that is that the piano are extra singers who do not, first of all, sort of typically bunch up with the main singers, the one who sing from, sing from those parts, um, soprano, alto, etc. cetera, um, but, but form a group for themselves. Uh, we have many, many documents that indicate that they stand somewhat apart from everybody else. But they're still not the modern chorus, let's say, standing behind the orchestra, singing the choral movement while the soloists shut up. The soloists or everybody are singing. So, if that is clear, what I'd like to do is now zero in on the simply titled parts, soprano, alto, piano, basso, and take a look at what have. So I'll go through the piano parts once more. And here I am again at the tenor part. That's where I shall be starting. Now, again, the music here is what is familiar to you, O Mensch bewein dein Süde groß. Should have that. I am not hearing it. Is anybody else hearing the audio? Hmm. Well, we'd hope to have you a sound example. Ah, well, let me try this again. I should, by the way, um, insert another thing about who very heroically put together sound samples for this presentation. That said, I should also use the formulation that you see in um, newspapers sometimes. The views expressed in these performances are not necessarily those of any of the panelists here. Now, let's take a look more closely at what is in this part. So here I start. Um, I see my fellow panelists on the right, but I, do I take it that you see only my slide here? Good. Um, you will notice that 
there is something there is something written beneath the first staff between staves one and two, which I have highlighted in a red box. Yes, that is not an 18th century red box. And what is evangelista? Now, evangelist, very good. What does that mean? Bach, in fact, typically refers to the gospel recitatives in his passions with the word evangelista. So we might think this is a movement title for such a recitative. But as you've just heard, this is not a recitative. This is a concerted movement in tempo. So that explanation won't work. So what then does it mean there? Well, I think intuitively there only seems one example, and it means this is the evangelist. This is the singer who sings the evangelist. Again, very different from the, what has become the typical modern conception of such a performance. Because the evangelist starts right out singing the first movement, O Mensch, Beweint ein Sünder Pols. But now we have to pause for a moment. Um, I hate to bring up such things, but I really must. There is an idea out there that from parts like this that are called tenore, Bach had three people singing. A principal singer who would hold a part and then two singers on either side of him who would read along with him. They were all male singers in Bach's performances. Now, uh, and by the way, the principal singer would have been called a concertist and the two singers surrounding that singer would have been called repiano singers, repianists. Now, I will be happy to address this further for anybody who is curious in the session afterwards, but just let me say here that this is um, a total fabrication. It is a fiction that was created through bad scholarship early in the 20th century. There is absolutely zero evidence, I must stress that, zero evidence behind it. And we would do well to put it out of our minds when we are looking at these parts, except in so far as I would like to put it to the test a little bit in what we see here. So I'm going to go to the next page here. This is the second or actually the third page of the part. Now, here we are, are is in the middle of the uh, second sort of complex of events, um, starting with the evangelist narrating uh, the first encounter between Jesus and the soldiers who are going to take him captive. Now, the idea of having people share their parts, uh, of course, raises a question. If, let's say, the concertist, the principal singer, simply sings everything, there's no problem. You know, he sees it all and just sings from the first note to the last. But as we know, not every movement seems to have all the singers. There are arias, there are recitatives. So your imagined pianists, who tradition, that is 20th century tradition, would imagine singing along with the concertist reading from this music, um, needed to have some further information, namely information telling them where to sing and where to shut up. So let's see if it's in fact there. Now, if we look at this page, at first it looks promising for indeed telling our putative piano singers um, what they should be doing. Here, let me come into a close up. And here, as you can see, um, we have an entrance of a chorus, text number 2b in your modern score, singing Jesum, and let me give you the music. We start from the beginning of this section. Und der hohe Priester und Mann, sehr viel. 
sections is in the Rapiano parts. So the question arises, what does chorus and evang evangelista, the two C, mean here? Is it simply telling one singer who is reading from this part um, how to sing? When it's chorus, you're in time and you're with other people. When it says evangelista, you're on your own and it's recitative. Or is it telling other people to enter and exit? In other words, is it a necessity or a courtesy? Well, let's look on a little bit further. Let's turn the page. And here we have a somewhat further in the piece um, section again, where in the middle of one of the evangelist recitatives, there is an assertion of all four voices singing. Um, I'll flip actually to another page where the example will come up where already I've marked some of what happens. This is going from number, uh, let's say going into number 12b, which is the, sort of, we think of the chorus, Bist du nicht seine Jünger Einer? And we'll see how that sounds. Um, before we hear it, I should just have you watch. What happens is here that in the line where the first red box appears, the copyist lost his place and jumped over a number of measures. So he had to fill in the missing measures at, measure at the bottom of the page. He put a Q there, that brace you see, and that leads you to the bottom of the page where you can see the number 12B. You sing across the page to the blue box and on the last notes from there, you jump back up to what is in the box. And that is, um, and then you continue singing. So we'll hear that and look at it too. Now, one could say um, anybody reading from this part would have been grateful for some indication of when to sing and when not. And as you see, it's not there. Here's one more example from this same tenor part. Now, this is the aria, Alt ihr angefochten Seelen. It's later on in the Passion. And as you all know, presumably, it's an aria for bass, the bass part is, by the way, in the basso part that also has Jesus and everything else. And there are interjections from the upper three voices, who the text is saying, um, 
go speedily to, well, go speedily to, go speedily to, and then I ask, where to, where to, Vohin, Vohin, to Golgotha. So the Vohin, you can see about four lines before the uh, bottom, and that is typically sung by everybody. We, we imagine that with a chorus singing it, and indeed it is in Bach's piano part, so the uh, voices are doubled here. However, when we listen to it, there is going to be another little wrinkle, which, uh, to which I'll call your attention in a second. Let's listen to a bit. Except I'm not hearing it. One more slide forward. Good. The only thing is this. Um, according to the old theory of things, you could tell what movements to sing in and not sing in by markings that we saw, such as a Vangelista chorus, but also, let's say, where recitative or aria appear, because we all know an aria is a piece for one singer. Well, here, as you can see in this tenor part, this movement is marked aria. Well, that's in contradiction with what we have been told to believe. It's saying only one singer is singing here. So something's not quite fitting right. Now, these are examples drawn from random. And I'm not going to pursue this really further because in fact, we have some really absolute proof on this matter. It's not in this part, but it is in this part. Here we have a part headed tenor servus. Now, let me explain what this is. There is, there are a sard apart from Jesus and the narration, a couple of ca characters in the drama of the passion. Um, there is Peter, there is Pilate, there is a serving woman, and there is a servant, a male servant. Now, if Bach is writing for three people to read from his part, he could very readily put the music of these characters in this main part. I mean, think of it. If you have the tenor part with the evangelist and a couple of other singers, isn't it logical that one of them would sing the servant, especially because then that singer can join in on all the choruses? Well, let's though look at what happens in this part. This is, I should say, a part that replaces one from an earlier performance that has been lost. This part is from 17. 1949, but it is clearly no different from the one that it replaced. And if we look a little bit more closely, you will see, and these are only a sample, it includes every movement of the entire first section and some in the second. And these include the choruses, and I have put their numbers and also put a box around each of them. Number one, first chorus, that's it. Number three, the whole scene with Jesum, Jesum, Jesum for Nazareth, Tatsit, Choral Tatsit. Uh, number 11, Choral Tatsit. Number 12B, Choral Tatsit. In other words, um, every movement that we think of as involving a choir is not here. Indeed, <laughs> this is very puzzling to those who are 
uh, basically, shall, shall we say, marinated in a traditional understanding of Bach's performances. The editor of the edition of the St. Matthew Passion in the Neue Bachausgabe, Arthur Mendel, a very distinguished scholar, who indeed had also been a very experienced choral conductor, wrote about this part and one of the that you shall see uh, very soon. It's strange that the movements, that these movements are all marked tatsit. They're not marked tatsit in the corresponding tenor evangel evangelista part that we've seen. And he's puzzled by that. Why? Because he feels there should be more singers here. Well, Bach is very, uh, very unambiguous about this. With this in view, let's take a quicker look at the bass part. Now here is Basso. This is again the 1725 part, again beginning with O Mensch Bewein. Now, this part does not even have anything like the Evangelista wording that we saw in the tenor part. It just begins with O Mensch Bewein dein Sinne Gross. Doesn't say what it is. Doesn't say whether this is choral bass, solo bass, whatever. Again, the part contains the choruses, the chorales, Jesus, bass arias, bass arias. Basically everything that the bass voice, basically everything that the bass voice sings. I'll come back to a couple of exceptions in a moment. And give it a closer look. And again, it marks changes at this moment between the chorus and non-chorus, or rather, well, let's take a look and listen. Not quite. You can see, already see the word chorus in what is on the screen now. Let's go further here. I have isolated some things and we'll listen to a bit. This is often heard before. If you were following this closely, <coughs> you'll have noticed that while the word chorus does appear, the name Jesus does not. Now, should we assume that everything not marked chorus is sung by, in fact, the one singer who is Jesus? There is a slight problem with this. Right above the boxed music is the end of the opening music, opening number which is a chorus and which we imagine we'll use 
all the singers who are here. But the first notes after that are Jesus singing, Wen suchet ihr? And they don't have any marking. When chorus is done, Jesum von Nazareth, Jesum von Nazareth, Jesum von Nazareth, the first music after that, that's in number 2C, is Ich bin's. So you're no longer in the chorus, and yet there's no marking there. The same thing going from 2D to 2E. So again, one can kind of try to work out every sort of strategy about how this might have worked, but that all ultimately becomes a circular exercise. And again, I have to stress that there's really very little rehearsal going on and that these parts really do put a premium on security. And everything works very, very well for just starting from the beginning and going to the end, but it apparently is running into some trouble if you imagine these additional singers. Now, once again, we can really eliminate any doubts. And that comes with this part. Some of you may um, think, oh my God, this looks very different from the others. And that is because in one way it is. This is a part that no longer exists or that if it exists, we don't know where it is. So I think it was lost in the Second World War. This is an old photograph of it. And that's all the Berlin Library has. Now, again, we see it's headed Basso Petrus et Pilatus, Space Peter and Paul. This is like the tenor service part. And you can probably already see that it marks all of its choral numbers, Tatset. So here is part one of the Passion, and you see the very first movement is marked, don't sing. <coughs> and after that, you can see a chorale, a chorale, etc. And number 11, just before uh, Peter sings, Ich bin's nicht, again, chorale tots it. So Bach explicitly excludes this singer from the choral movements. Again, it would have been so easy to have the singer singing along in them. And similarly for part two, and I've only marked a couple of these spots here. Movement 16b, if you're following your scores. This is after Pilate sings, was bringet ihr für Klage wieder diesen Menschen? Uh, what accusations do you bring against him? What complaints do you bring against him? And then they answer, if you were not a criminal, we wouldn't have brought him to you. But again, the part is silent there. Okay. Take stock for a moment. We have a tenor part, which seems to be meant for one singer, the tenor of the evangelist, and a bass part, which seems to be meant for one singer, the singer of Jesus. And in fact, we get some, some further confirmation of this. Now, as you know, in the parts from 1725, the Passion began with O Mensch Bewein, and Bach had to replace this and restore Herr Unser Herrscher. So he did this in 1730 with a sheet of paper, a couple of sheets that he pasted over, sewed over O Mensch Bewein. Here you have the tenor part, and it's Herr Unser Herrscher. But if you look more closely, you can probably see this already in the upper right-hand corner. Bach has also written here Evangelista. It's a scoring indication, if you will. This is the evangelist. And I think clearly by this time, we can all see it means the evangelist and not anybody else. Similarly, Basso, Jesus. Basso and Jesus. So it's the part that belongs to Jesus, to Jesus. Now again, I must stress, this is different from our modern practice in several ways, not least of which is that the same bass is Jesus, is singing choruses, is singing chorales, is singing, is singing arioso movement and arias. And one singer reading from that part doing that all. Let's take a quick look at the soprano. This is again back to 1725 with Omensch Bewein. 
we've seen this before, you're seeing it again. And just a very quick look at a detail inside. Here is <coughs> a little bit further in the opening section. And you can see at the upper left-hand corner on this screen, um, the entry Choral, which says, ah, everybody's singing here. And if you look down a bit and to the right, you see number six, the sequence of numbers six, seven, and eight. Six is a recitative and rests are marked there. I sometimes wonder what does this tell us about the performance of the recitatives that they assume that people could count out the rests. Try doing that in most modern performances. Then you have aria tatset. Okay, that's the alto aria von den Stricken. And then you have, um, again, rests for a recit. And the movement that follows is the soprano aria, ich folge dir gleich falls. And again, it would have been helpful, one might think, to have the word aria there. That should at least make it clear who's doing what. But as you see, nothing is there. Now, as I say, if aria is just a courtesy telling how to sing, it's not that bad that it's missing. It's worse if it creates any confusion about what to sing. Now, again, we have some further confirmation. As we saw with the tenor and the bass parts, in 1730, for the next performance of the Passion, Bach replaced Herr und Herr, I'm um, sorry, O Mensch Bewein, with Herr und Herrscher, restored it. And this is what the sheet that restores it looked like. Looks like. It says soprano. You also see it says chorus at the left. But one has to bear in mind that chorus is a generic title. It means something that's sung by all the singers, but it does not necessarily mean song, something sung by masked singers. My favorite example that some of you may know already is, for example, the, um, the coffee cantata, which ends with three singers singing together. One of them is a soprano whose part bears the title Liskin, just like tenore evangelista, soprano Liskin. There's a bass, schlendron, and a tenor, and they sing together in what we all assume is a tercet, a trio, and that's the way we always hear it, and yet that's marked by Bach, chorus. Even the two-voice conclusion of the peasant cantata, BWV 212, two voices, is marked chorus. This is an old operatic convention. Chorus is where the singers who are present sing together. It doesn't tell us how many singers are present. And if we have any doubt about this, at least in this part, we can resolve it very quickly because there is a little bit more, and that is the, um, a, a folder in which Bach wrote a title page, and that is here. <laughs> and now we can see that Bach actually wrote soprano concertato, concerted soprano. I think nobody will have any problem with the notion that a concerted soprano is a single singer. You may ask, why did Bach specify concerted soprano, concertato? This is not common with him. Usually he just calls the part soprano, as you see there, and as it had been all along. The reason here is that we have, remember, other singers, piano singers, that second group of singers. And there you have a soprano as well, which is soprano rapieno, who has a more limited function. So soprano concertato distinguishes this soprano from the rapieno. It's kind of like what is sometimes called a retronym. You know, called a golden actual people and let's see alto this is alto in 1725 Joshua excuse, me. Joshua excuse me for a moment at least for my audio uh, the last point you made uh, broke up quite badly. For my benefit, could you repeat that? Happily, thank you, Dan. 
uh, was it around here talking about um, retronyms and soprano concertato, yes. etc. Yes. The point about retronyms. Could you repeat that for me? Gladly. <coughs> um, the point is that we adopt different coinages for different circumstances. And let's say the default coinage for that six streamed instrument that you held in your lap and plucked was guitar. But since the development of the electric guitar, we had to distinguish between these two different kinds of guitars. And so the term acoustic guitar is coined or similarly analog watch next to digital watch. So this is a similar bit of terminology. It doesn't change the thing itself, but it adds an extra fillip of distinction concerning what that thing is. And the distinction is useful here um, because it separates this part from the repieno. Now I should say that that is not usually the case. In earlier performances, the part was simply called soprano. And that was already enough to distinguish it from soprano ripieno. And in fact, that is usually the case. But Bach is being extra fastidious here, as we see. The copying is beautiful. So he labels that soprano concertato. And again, what started out as alto becomes alto concertato. It doesn't change anything. It merely affirms and makes explicit what was implicit and understood all along. So let's run through the parts as we have them in 1730, going bottom to top. We have Basso Jesus, Tenore Evangelista, Alto Concertato, and soprano concertato. So there we have one group of singers, each of whom reads from his own individual part. Now the question is, of course, is this all there is? And we know it's not because we have those repieno parts. So we should come back to them a bit, discuss their implications, and I think the first thing to do is to consider something of the institutional circumstances here. Now, many of you may know this, but it's worth reviewing it, I think. In Leipzig, Bach has to supply singers to services in four different churches. His singers come from the uh, pupils of the St. Thomas School, the Thomas Schule, who, by the way, we speak of as boys, but go up to the age of 20, 21, 22, in fact. And he had to stock four different musical performances on a typical Sunday with these people. So naturally, he takes the best, the cream of the crop, for himself to perform in one of the two principal churches of the city, St. Thomas or St. Nicholas, where basically you perform on alternate Sundays. The next best group he sends to the other principal church where it sings under his direction, but directed by a prefect, an advanced pupil, and sings simpler music. And then the sort of level goes down. The third group goes and can sing to another church and can sing only motets, and the last ones can only sing chorales, and rather badly at that. Now, that's your normal circumstance. On certain feast days, and Good Friday is certainly one of them, there are not two services, one at St. Thomas, one at St. Nicholas, but rather there is one service only in one of those two churches. The St. The St. John Passion seems always to be done at St. Nicholas. I say seems because they're always a little bit of, um, there's always some uncertainty with the St. John Passion about which you'll no doubt hear more from Dan Malamed. So Bach can bring his first and second choirs, first and second 
ensembles to these performances. So you have more singers than customary. Ah. So what does that mean for us? Well, these are the more demanding parts. These are clearly the first choir o cantorai. What about the Rupieni? There, the second choir brought in. Doesn't normally see, which doesn't normally sing under Bach and with Bach's first singers. And they are clearly the Rupieno singers. And they sing a secondary role, and basically they are brave, you might say. Now, this is what Bach has and what he does. As you can see, this already suggests a very different understanding of this music than is traditional for us. Um, it is certainly, however you interpret this, smaller. It is certainly, in a sense, more flexible because the same people are doing more. The question arises, of course, of just how dispensable are these Rupieno singers? Um, and strictly speaking, as we mentioned, they are dispensable. At least Bach felt he could dispense with them when he sent parts to somebody else. In other words, he's saying, you don't need them to perform this piece. Or if you think you do, you can work a way to copy them out yourself, which actually would have been very difficult with this piece, but leave that to one side. Uh, in fact, as Dan will explain, these piano parts are at least for a certain number of performances necessary because they contain some stuff that you don't get elsewhere. But the necessity is you can ask the question, you know, is it necessary contrapuntally or necessarily aesthetically? And basically, piano singers are not necessarily contrapuntally. They are just doubling. They are just thickening the texture, if you will. Bach clearly under certain, certain circumstances like to use, likes to use them, or maybe he feels he has to use them because he has these, all, all these people there. But anyway, they are certainly present here. And that must obviously shape our sense of how this passion will be performed, at least was performed in Bach's day, and can shape our sense of, as I say, whom we're going to ask to come along for our performance. That is, if we want our performance to reflect at all what Bach's performances did. Now, as someone who has lived in the world most of his life, where we do sort of take that for granted, if you will, I have to say that there's really no necessity to do that. It's not a law, it's not a moral law. This is something that every musician has to decide individually. So all of this stuff is just there for information and every performer must then make their own decisions from this. Am I going to go with what Bach seems to have done? Am I going to go with something that's different, more traditional? Um, these are questions that obviously I'm not going to raise here. I would think that they're questions on the mind of some of you out there in the audience. And again, I hope that you will bring them up for Dan and Ellen and me to discuss because they certainly are very vital ones. And they're obviously what gets us to the ultimate brown brass text. Let's say when you're going from before the downbeat to the downbeat itself. Now, I found my material a little bit sooner than I'd left time for. So if we have a few minutes before Dan Malama takes over, I wonder if Dan and Ellen might chip in some and elaborate a little bit or raise some questions, um, perhaps anticipating or telepathically fit knowing what might be on some of your minds. Thank you. I think I want to start, if I could, with an interesting question that a, uh, an attendee has sent in. Um, and I can share something on the screen if Joshua would like to unshare, if that's a word. Of course. Stop his... 
second. And I will share something because the question is about um, a particular document. Okay. So is that, uh, is that performing part now visible? Yep. Um, here's the interesting question. Um, why uh, the waste of paper, the attendee asked, for the tenor service part? Couldn't he have memorized this and sung when Bach pointed at him? Might he have been one of the instrumentalists or a page turner or one of the clergy? Um, that's a really good question. There's lots of things in there to consider. Um, first of all, in a way, the least interesting thing, or at least concerning thing to me, it's certainly interesting, um, is the idea of memorization. Um, this is extremely complex music, uh, an hour and a half, hour and 40 minutes long. And you have to remember that this is new music. The performers um, in the St. Nicholas Church are the Leipzig New Music Ensemble, right? Um, and the idea that you would get a, tell a young singer, oh, memorize this, and there's, there's no way to take music home to, to memorize it because Bach wasn't going to give you the autograph score. And it's very clear that uh, performing parts were carefully guarded. How do we know this? We know this because they survive. Um, right. If you've been, ever let people take parts home, you know um, uh, it's, it's roulette, uh, whether you're going to get them back or not. But we, we have astonishingly complete sets of parts. So clearly people didn't have them. Um, there is simply doesn't seem to be any precedent for memorizing little bits and pieces of a concerted work like this. So what about the other part? Um, uh, might the singer of this have been one of the instrumentalists or a page turner or one of the clergy? Well, sure, but that's actually telling in itself. The point is that whoever was handed this part, maybe one of the instrumentalists, although I don't think so, don't. one of the clergy, whoever was handed with this part was a singer capable of following his way through the piece, um, capable of singing, uh, recitative like gospel narrative um, and instructed not to sing anything else. And the point here is not so much the question of who sang this, but the fact that it documents the presence of a capable tenor singer whose only job was to sing Sollte du den Hohen Priester also antworten and then wait a couple of minutes and sing Sah ich dich nicht im Garten bei ihm and to do nothing else. And sure, who knows who it might have been, but the point it was it wasn't the principal tenor and it wasn't the tenor um, rapiano singer. How do we know that? Well, it would have been possible just to write this into the rapiano uh, part. And in fact, in the case, for example, of the, of the words sung by Peter, Peter's words and music are in the bass rapiano part. So gotcha. Bach was perfectly capable of putting music for an interlocutor like this um, in one of the extant parts and did for Peter. And in fact, the um, couple of little interjections of the maid, the Antilla, are in fact in the soprano concertist part. Um, yeah. And um, making it pretty clear that Bach was making choices. Um, in which part should I put a given interlocutor's line? And in this case, he put it in a, uh, a very brief part, tenor service, it's just a half sheet of paper. Um, half of a full sheet of paper, um, and handed it to somebody who was not one of the principal singers and isn't even given the option of joining in on the choruses and the chorales, is told explicitly um, in Latin, do not sing. Uh, Ellen, do you want to have something you want to add to this? Uh, no, I think that covers it beautifully. I also um, think that anytime Bach or his squad of copyists bothered to do something, it, there must have been a fairly practical reason for it. And as you said, this was new music. They wouldn't have had time to practice. It's a threat. I mean, it's kind of, um, if it's done this way, I like to always assume like there, that, that Bach knew his ensemble and who he was working with and that this had to be the way it went. Yeah. But I'd just like to add two points. One about wasting paper. As Dan mentioned, this is actually only a half a leaf of paper. In other words, Bach, did not waste the bottom half of it. He, he cut it away and I think was using it for something else. Um, the second thing is whether it could have been an instrumentalist or somebody. Um, 
in such circumstances, then they do exist, it is typical to find a cue in the part and sometimes a cue in another part, sending you to where you are supposed to go. Uh, I mentioned the premium that is placed on precision in these precisely because they are so ill-suited to many of the rehearsal conventions we take for granted. And so therefore, what you would typically find in, I'll, I'll make this up, but you do have such instances, let's say it would be tenor service, and then it would give some text that the evangelist sings, and you know, say sing after these things, and there would be a cue sign in the upper left or something like that, which would attach to another part. In other words, you'd be reading along in your other part, you'd see a cue and perhaps a message saying, go to such and such and this would be the such and such. So the absence of any such thing is also very telling. And I wanna add, that's a good point. And I wanna add that we do have such an example for vocal parts for a passion that J.S. Bach performed. Um, among uh, his passion repertoire was not just his own pieces, but a couple of pieces by other composers. And one of them was a St. Mark passion. And when he, one of the earlier times, he performed it multiple times and one of the times he performed it, um, he wrote out parts pretty much like the tenor service that we saw here. It happens that Judas and Caiaphas, uh, it's a Mark passion, so Judas and Caiaphas have words to, to sing, um, were evidently in a separate part, um, like, like, like this one, with, apparently with just Judas and Caiaphas. But apparently in some later, they're in the alto range, by the way, apparently in some later performance, um, Bach didn't use a, an additional singer, an alto, who sang just those words of Judas and Caiaphas. He asked his alto concertist, his principal alto, to sing them. And we know that because Judas and Caiaphas, those words are cued into that part, which I think we can understand as uh, an indication, look over at the other part, the one that looked like this tenor service part, and sing those. So um, that's an example of, of um, apparently a, an unusual situation, but in which um, there were more performing parts than there were um, singers. Of course, it, in other aspects of that piece, when Bach wanted an interlocutor in a particular part, sung by a particular singer, he put it in there. So Bach was capable of making that kind of cue, and we even have one for the interlocutors in the vocal parts of a, of a passion he performed. So he was right. perfectly capable of doing it. We know that because we have this example in which he did it. Yeah. And I'll again add something that we've seen the tenor service and the basses Petrus at Pilatus, and there are really identical parts in Bach's St. Matthew Passion. There are two extra bass parts for um, Petrus, Pilatus, one has both characters and one for um, the high priest, I believe. And these are separate. And again, they mark every choral movement, tots it. Needless to say, by the way, the base of chorus one in the St. Matthew Passion is Basso Jesus, and the tenor is Tenore Evangelista. So you have the exact same situation there. So this is a convention that, in fact, Bach knows well, was well understood, and is, again, I'd like to think pretty obvious in its implications. We're close to your presentation, but I wonder, Ellen, Dan, any, any other things that you'd like us to try to clear up before um, there, seeing the question of versions? Yeah. There are some more questions that have shown up in the Q&A box. Dan and Joshua, are you both able to see those? I can't see them, but if you can read them, I'll, I'll, I'll see them. Dan, are there? Yes, I see them. Okay. okay. Um, they're, they're fairly interesting. There's one, um, Xiao Shi has asked, when the tenor and bass concertists go through their lines, yeah. they presumably switch in and out of characters going from Evangelista Jesus to the chorus part. Wouldn't the lack of marking of Jesus chorus Evangelist pose a problem for the singer looking at the part? That's a very good question, a very interesting question. Um, I think, Yes, in a way it poses a problem, but people react quickly to circumstances. Um, you have actually a similar example to this in Schubert, in the Schöne Müllerin. The penultimate song is uh, Der Müller und der Bach, and that's a dialogue between the Miller, who has been rejected and is going to commit suicide, and the brook, 
into which he dives in the next song. And um, Müller's poem, in fact, has three strophes which are labeled Der Müller, Der Bach, Der Müller. Miller, Brock, Miller. But in the um, first edition of Schubert's setting, the only source we have from Schubert's lifetime, the first strophe is headed Der Müller. It appears there, you know, like a role listing, a dramatic role. But actually, the, the Bach and the second Müller are not there. So the singer has to figure it out and adapt to it. The point is that that is the realm of courtesy, as I say. The basic, um, you know, the, the, the dollars and cents question is, where do you start singing and where do you stop singing? How you sing is a nicety. And obviously you appreciate help there, but that help is not always as forthcoming as I'm sure Bach's singers may have wished, and sometimes we may wish. But as far as I know, basically, Bach never lets you in doubt about what you are singing or playing. The question is also interesting because it's asking, what is it, what's it like, how, how difficult is it, what does it mean for one singer to go in and out of different duties, and even in a dramatic sense, in and out of different roles, and that goes to the question of how dramatic you think this um, uh, music is. I have come to think of it more as narrative than dramatic. It's not operatic in the sense that we are, we are asked to identify one human being, one singer standing there uh, with a particular character, but they move in and out of roles. Uh, yeah. Alan, I know this is something you've thought a, a, a lot about. Do you want to say something about that? Uh, about that? Um, we had an interesting conversation about this very concept in a course at NEC last year. And one of the students brought up the concept of sort of like a communal storytelling, which works really well for um, the passion narrative in a way, because it's, it's, it's different singers singing very different roles, but all telling the same story to a community of people who already know it. It's like a retelling plus instruction, theological instruction on how we're meant to understand the events. And it's not, the arias and things are not in the voices of particular biblical characters, which is something that is a little bit confusing um, to a lot of people who are coming into this um, project because you sort of think, well, I'm singing an aria after this thing has happened to Peter, therefore Peter is singing it. But that's not actually part of the design of um, the messaging here. Mm -hmm. So communal storytelling, when you're a singer singing different sort of labels, you're you're the evangelist here, you're a chorus member here, you're reflecting on something that a, a, a biblical character did somewhere else. It doesn't mean that it is you who are Peter or you who are Jesus all the time or you who are Joseph of Arimathea and the Matthew Passion singing Mache dich mein Herz rein. That's, um, that's not necessarily an accurate way to think about these parts. Yeah. In fact, there's a, there's a famous example in the St. John Passion, an extreme one, that just after Jesus says his last words on the cross, es ist vollbracht, it goes right into a bass aria. Yeah. Mein teurer Heiland, lass dich fragen. And so the same singer who's just been Jesus does a quick turnaround and is now a soul addressing Jesus, but it's the same singer. Um, we've now, we have, I, I knew we couldn't avoid and we don't want to avoid the aesthetic implications. I'll just add one thing musically. Um, I think the difference that, I mean, it's very, very nicely characterized, Ellen, and one thing that I feel as a musician is that in such a performance, it's also a sort of much more fluid and flexible and nuanced manner of presentation. It's not all or nothing between, you know, the evangelist here, Jesus there, the chorus there, etc. But rather it is something that flexibly grows larger, smaller, um, takes on this ca color, this character, this idea, etc. And for some of us, obviously, who choose to do it this way, this I think is um, one of the really decisive reasons for making that choice. It's um it's sort of our an operatic conception and a stage conception kind of messing with us, 
in terms of how we view this piece, because most of us have received it as a staged work with soloists standing in front and a giant chorus in the back and those individual soloists, we aren't identifying as part of the community of storytellers. They are somehow separate. Um, there wasn't a whole, to my understanding, there wasn't really a visual, much of a visual element to this performance in box time, because it's, it's part of a church service. It's not a concert. It's not an opera. It's not a staged work. It has an inherent kind of drama, but it's not a drama that you see. In um, fact, probably the, um, the congregation didn't even see, see the performers who were up in a choir loft. Uh, which is usually behind them or to a side. So it's not a visual experience. There's one other thing that maybe is worth mentioning. I think of um, a lovely line by the late Martin Geck, distinguished German scholar, who once pointed out that in a church service like this, he was speaking about the St. Matthew Passion. Uh, he said, you know, in liturgical circumstances, the thing about the music is you don't have to listen to it. And this is a sobering thought. Who would not want to listen to the St. Matthew Passion? Who would not want to listen to St. John Passion? And of course, many did. But still, it is not, the point that's made is it's not presentational in the way of making a statement, you know, standing in front of people and doing that as we do now. Of course, uh, we would not necessarily want to go back to a circumstance in which you don't have to listen to it. We do want people to listen to the music when we do it. But this distance is, again, one of the interesting challenges that I think um, grappling with the kind of thing we see here will present a performer and you know, raise the question of how do we deal with this music and what is this music with which we're dealing? Um, I have a, a couple of other uh, points that come from interesting questions. Um, so let me uh, do a couple of those. I'm going to share a screen uh, once more. It seems not to come. Ah, oh. Ah. Got it? Yeah. Good. Um, so uh, Joshua that is mentioned hard, isn't it? that Joshua mentioned that there are um, parts like the um, tenor service for the St. Matthew Passion, and I happen to have him here. So here's a bass part from the original performing parts from the 1736 right. of the St. Matthew Passion. So here's a bass part that has music, music for Judas, both in part one and part two, and for one of the two priests, uh, the little duet in which they reject the 33 um, uh, silver pieces. Um, and here's another bass part. Uh, it's got two pages. Uh, from also from the Passion, uh, it's got Peter, um, it's got um, a priest. priest, and then it's got priest two in that duet. Um, and then here's a soprano part. Um, it's got um, the maid in two different utterances, and it's got um, uh, Pilatus' wife, Pilate's wife. So um, you think about it for a second, it means that in addition to the base of the first chorus in the Matthew Passion and the base of the second chorus, there are um, two bass singers, one handed this part and one handed that part, who by the absence either of um, other material in this or any cue, presumably are not singing those, those other, uh, other movements. Um, well, in fact, in one of those two bass parts, the second and bigger one, there are lots of choral movements in the middle. You see them sort of like in the lower third of the page and they're all marked, shut up. Yep, yep. Um, and then let's see what else um, came from the questions. Uh, here's an interesting one, and, and this is somebody clearly thinking closely about, about this. Um, is it possible that piano parts could have been shared by multiple singers? We've already come to the conclusion that that's just not a good guess as to how the concertist parts, the tenor evangelist and the bass Jesus and alto and soprano were designed and meant to be used. But it's a good question. Could the piano parts have been shared by multiple singers? Yeah. Um, the answer, of course, is yes, of course they could have. They could have done almost anything. But once again, if you look at how they are designed, it doesn't look as if they were designed to be used that way. One of the, uh, uh, the uh, indications for me for that is in the St. John Passion materials is, as I mentioned, the bass for piano part has the music for Peter in it. And you can imagine hypothetically a, 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 an appropriate label for that bass for piano part might have been basso Rapiano Petrus, right? Uh, now it doesn't say that, it just says bass for piano, um, but it looks as if that part was designed to be used by um, one, one singer. 
And the other piece of evidence is that we have got a couple of examples from Bach and certainly plenty from others where when um, the person directing a performance wanted multiple Rapiano singers, he would have multiple Rapiano copies of the Rapiano part copied out. It just does not seem to have been the practice in Leipzig, uh, which is where we're talking about, Bach performing, church performing practice in Leipzig. It does not seem to have been the practice um, for multiple singers to sing from a Rapiano part. Doesn't mean it, they couldn't have done it, but local convention was you, di you didn't. That isn't how things work. So it, it's, it's an excellent question. It's there a very good question because in principle, obviously, you could have more. And as Dan mentioned, you do have circumstances, not in Leipzig, in which there are multiple copies. There may be two, three, four soprano or piano. That's the case in Vienna, for example. Um, but what's interesting is that still each singer gets his own music, his own sheet of music. Uh, it could be otherwise, but there is actually a lot more evidence. We won't bore you with it all now, but that does indicate that, yes, Rupiani, um are singing singly from their music uh, throughout the entire 17th century. You have this in the 18th century. Well, I mentioned one little bit of evidence that's worth thinking about here. Um, obviously, if you, if you have four main singers or concertists and four repianists, that's eight, right? Two, 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 two. Now, there is a Bach secular cantata, Der Streit zwischen Fergus und Pan, that's BWV 201, that has concerted parts for six singers. And they all have names, like Basso Jesus, Tenor Petrus, they all have their characters' names in the parts. So it's very clear that each of these parts is meant for one singer. And they are a soprano part, an alto part, um, two tenor parts, and two bass parts. So there are six parts, but there are then two extra parts, and there is an extra soprano part and an extra alto part. So they flesh out, they sing the soprano part doubles, the soprano who sings, I think, molus, the alto part doubles the soprano who sings another god. So again, you have an ensemble of eight singers. This is in fact something of a norm in the period. Um, eight is, is a very, very common number. And in this case, it's not always a number of the people who actually sing in a piece, but in this case it is. Uh, and you can find a lot further evidence of sort of like four plus four, but not four plus 12, 16, 24. That's much, much rarer. And then finally, there are uh, several questions from um, attendees who want to know about rehearsing this music. What did they do in the absence of measure numbers and rehearsal letters? And what do we know about uh, 18th century uh, re rehearsal practice? And in particular, what do we know about Bach's rehearsal of his concerted church music? Um, certainly for the last, the last question, what do we know about Bach's rehearsal of this music? If we're going to be really honest with ourselves, the answer to that is nothing whatsoever. Yeah. We don't know what kind of time was blocked out for it. We don't really know where that kind of rehearsal would have taken place. We don't know that they did take, did, uh, that they did take place. Um, all we know is that Bach wrote this music, um, year, this kind of music year after year after year, and then continued to pull it off the shelf and fought tooth and nail with authorities to make sure there were people who were around who were qualified to, to perform it. Clearly they got through it in, in, in some way. Um, we do not know. Um, it's been pointed out that, that um, there are mistakes in the parts. These are hand copied parts, probably done in, in a relative hurry by a, team of, by a team of people and Bach always reviewed these parts and caught what mistakes he could. But it's been pointed out that there are potentially catastrophic uncorrected errors in some of the Bach performing parts for the, the, uh, the cantatas. At the very least, you'd think that uh, performers would write in a missing measure or a, a note to themselves. Um, there, is, there essentially is none of that. You do not find performers markings in these parts. Nowadays, if you show up for a modern choral or orchestral rehearsal without a pencil, you might get thrown out, right? Um, you have to bring a pencil. It seems to have been essentially the opposite expectation in the 18th century. You did not put marks on these, on these parts, as far as we can tell. Well, also, they didn't have really widespread portable 
writing implements. They didn't have ballpoint pens. Pencils are not all that common. So it's a different kind of culture. I might just add to that uh, two things. One is that there is some evidence that the parts get to the people at the last minute. The stuff is really like done the night before, ready to sing the night before or the day before. So there's not even much time to study a part. The other thing is that what we see with Bach is actually typical. The entire 17th century, 18th century, uh, it's a very different culture from ours. And that has very interesting implications for how one performs this music even today, or at least something to contemplate. I should stop there because I know we need to get to Dan, and I think some people might need a little breather for a second before yeah, we... Yeah, so thank you all. Um, obviously, we couldn't get to all the Q&A questions, but... Um, for those that we can't get to in the course of the next session, we will uh, have them ready to go for the panel discussion. Um, and so we're only a few minutes behind, so we'll resume um, approximately uh, five to seven minutes from now. So uh, thank you all and see you in a little few moments. Okay, well, I think we're all back here and ready to go and resume with our uh, second session. Um, so we'll hand it over to Professor uh, Daniel Mohammed of Indiana University, who's going to talk about the complex issue of versions um, and editions and so forth. So uh, Professor Mohammed, take us away. Thank you. Um, I have shared a screen. You should see the title screen at the moment. Could somebody confirm that, that you can see it? Yep. Good. Thank you. So we've been blithely talking on about the St. John Passion um, uh, in the hope that there is such a thing and that it is uh, a singular thing, the St. John Passion. But um, as you uh, might well know, um, it's not that easy to pin down. You've already seen the um, amount of... Uh, intervention in the parts that Bach and his copyist made all those changes. And it turns out to be a, a complicated question of how many St. John passions there are, how many versions there are. Even the question comes up, what is a version? Um, and then at the end, at least the question, what can and should we do today? So we can spend a little time um, looking at that and seeing what kinds of issues comes out of, come out of the fact that um, Bach continuously revised this piece. So we have to start with the way the piece is transmitted. That is how it comes down to us. And you might recognize, recognize this as um, Bach's uh, autograph score of the piece. Uh, you can tell, I think, from its neatness, by the careful uh, calligraphy, by the uh, very straight bar lines, by the fact that there's, a set, there's exactly the number of uh, staves necessary on this page to fit the music, that this is not Bach's composing score. Uh, this is a so-called fair copy. It's in his calligraphic hand, uh, the one you see on neckties and tote bags and, and so on. This is his beautiful handwriting. And he's clearly copying from something uh, in front of him. Um, and in fact, that is the form in which we have um, the, 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 the Bach's autograph, Bach's original score of the St. John Passion, uh, something that he recopied. And it turns out he did that around um, 1739. And so um, there's about 10 leaves of that. So here's the 20th page. You can see a probably original page numbering at the, at the bottom. But when you go on to the next page, something changes. So here's the, facing, here's the facing page. This is the continuation of the piece. But if you look in a little more detail, then you might be able to recognize that this is a change in handwriting. And so what you're seeing at the top is what's on the left-hand page here. And what you're seeing at the bottom is what's on the uh, right-hand page. And that's a different copyist. Uh, J.S. Bach, in one case, and, and, a, and an assistant, a copyist, happens to be a student um, named uh, Baumler um, uh, on the right. And the story here is that Bach, when he recopied this piece, presumably from his autograph composing score, got only about, 20, uh, about 10 leaves, about 20 pages in, and then gave up. And then at some point, probably around the time of the 1749 uh, performance of the piece, um, uh, he assigned uh, Baumler, uh, his student and assistant, to um, finish the, the copy. And so what we have is actually a partial autograph score of the piece. This is going to turn out to, uh, when we get a little further into this discussion, this is going to turn out to be a, have some interesting consequences. 
The other form in which this piece is transmitted, um, as you've seen from what Joshua has been showing us, is a big stack of performing parts. And I just put a few here. Um, uh, there's a concerted alto part. You now know what that means. Uh, there's a, in the back, there's a soprano or piano part. There's a violin one part. Um, and there's a, there's a tenor vocal part. This is a big stack of parts. Uh, this is a very complicated stack of parts, it turns out, um, that um, many scholars have spent a lot of time sorting out. And in fact, it turns out, and you can sort out by uh, how a paper of, of one layer distinguishes itself from the paper of, a, of another layer, and the participation of various copyists, and the changes over time in J.S. Bach's handwriting, you, we can sort out um, that there are, in fact, um, several layers of material here. And these correspond, um, more or less, to what we think represents uh, at least four different performances of the piece. So from Bach's first performance of this piece in 1724, we have this small assortment of parts, the four vocal piano parts, um, one copy each of violin one, violin two, and a basso continuo part. Um, then um, we can date uh, later, as uh, Joshua said, from the 1725 reperformance uh, of the piece, we've got a bunch of additional parts the four concerted vocal parts, soprano concertante, alto concertante, tenor evangelist, and basso Jesus, understanding that I'm not trying to account here um, in, this, in this summary for the fact that concertante was a later addition to the soprano part, but as Joshua pointed out, that was just a clarification, right? Um, and then uh, two traverso parts, two oboe parts, uh, two more violin parts, viola and continuo. Um, then from uh, 1730, um, we have uh, various interventions in the parts, um, mostly inserts and crossings out and pasteovers and uh, leaves tipped in and so on. In addition, Bach made a new uh, performing part for viola da gamba um, and a new organ part for, um, for, one, uh, for one movement. So there aren't that many new parts, but there are changes in intervention. And then finally, in 1749, when he comes back to this piece again, he makes um, two new interlocutor parts. Those are the very parts we were talking about a minute ago, tenor servus, basso petrus of Pilatus, another copy of violin one, another viola part, and two parts marked harpsichord, one of which has um, basso continuo figures in it. So you can sort out these layers, and they, we can use them to begin to understand what the piece sounded like in the various years in which we know Bach performed it. And um, our surest bet is looking at the parts that Bach likely used in the second performance in 1725. So let's go through those. First of all, he had some material from the 1724 performance. Uh, apparently, among things he did not, if we're right about this, send off to somebody else. Um, he kept these for himself, along with the score. So he was able to reuse those parts. He was able to reuse soprano, alto, tenor, bass, or piano violin one, violin two, and continuo. And the reason we know they were reused is we can date the parts 1724 from the paper and the copyists and so on, but they contain the changes and corrections and modifications necessary to perform the 1725 version, which as we'll see in a few minutes has some, has some differences. Then he made a bunch of new parts, as we said in 1725, and those become part of the sets. Um, the concerted vocal parts, um, apparently the little interlocutors parts, tenor and bass, those happen not to survive. The, two, the woodwind parts um, and um, uh, the continuo and uh, extra additional string parts. And so they combine to be what's uh, on the left-hand column here. In addition, um, there must also have been a few other parts, right? You needed to have an organ part to play organ continuo. That doesn't survive. There must have been a viola da gamba part because the viola da gamba line um, uh, in um, as is Fulbrach isn't in any of the other parts, it must have existed. And the, uh, there must have been a lute part from 1724, which actually doesn't belong on this list because it wouldn't have been used in, in 1725. We can, we can come back to that. Um, but um, I will point out that what you have here is a very typical looking set of Bach performing parts when you compare it to performing materials we have for lots of his other Leipzig concerted church music. One copy each of soprano, alto, tenor, bass. There aren't that many pieces with rapiano vocal parts, but there are some. So one copy each of soprano, alto, tenor, bass, rapiano. One um, 
woodwind uh, part for each woodwind line, in this case, two traversi and two oboes, two copies of violin one, two copies of violin two, one copy of viola, um, and two continuo parts, meaning just the bass line to be played on melodic um, fossil continuo instruments, uh, presumably one cello and one violone, and an, and an organ part. And then, um, as necessary, uh, individual parts for special instruments, special coloristic instruments that might be brought in for just one movement. This is an entirely typical looking set of Bach performing parts when you have seen uh, a lot of them and, and think about it. So um, here is um, uh, an example of what a mess some of these are. Um, this is from the 1724 uh, violin one part, again copied in 24 for the first version of the piece and then reused and doctored um, for the 1725 performance and I've blown up that little cross out. And you can see that the original instructions, and they, it said there's an, uh, there's an aria coming here, and that be, had to be um, uh, crossed out and then replaced with instructions to look at the music for a different substitute aria there. And then that all had to be crossed out again when the original aria was, was put back. I mean, there are layers and layers of these corrections. And you can even see that even today, there's at least two different colors of ink there. The top layer is a lot blacker than the, than the bottom layer. Um, so these parts are full of that kind of thing. Uh, here's another one also from that violin one part. This is a particular mess. Um, and uh, what you can see here um, is a series of changes over time. Um, this is the chorale Petrus de Nistenk that ends part one of the Passion. You can see Fine della uh, Parte Prima. Um, and here's the chorale. And that when Bach um, made certain changes in the piece at, at one point, um, the aria that preceded it was not um, you know, Achmein Zinn, that we're expected to see at that point, but a different piece in a different key. And so he decided that for tonal unity, I guess, the chorale needed to be um, not in A, but in G. So crossed out here is the remnants of the instruction to play this chorale um, one step lower. Ein Ton Tifa, they can't quite read all of it, gespielt wird. Um, and then he decided to try and indicate that, and you can see that he has fattened each of the note heads um, by one line or space to try and um, transpose it down. And then that gets crossed out. And then when he restores the piece back to its higher key to A major, this is Bach's very late handwriting, he crosses all this out and copies it out again in the original key. And so um, this part served for four performances, and you can see the remnants of that. And what we have really is a stack of parts um, that were in a particular state at a particular performance, a particular moment in time. And in reconstructing this, you have to ask, what did this part look like in, say, 1730? And you have to sort out those layers. And actually, all four layers are here on this, uh, on this page, right? Because this part started in 1724, and it got used all the way through the process. So what got changed between 1724 and 1725? Um, principally what got changed um, were concerted movements, the inserted text. There was, there is some tinkering with a little bit of the gospel text that we'll come back to uh, in a minute, but it mostly has to do with um, the interpolated poetic movements. So in fact, Bach replaced the opening chorus, Hauenser Herrscher, with a chorale setting, O Mensch Bewein. Um, he replaced the closing chorale, Ach Herr Lass Dein Lieb Engelein, with a different chorale setting, Christu Dulam Gottes, a chorale version of the Agnus Dei. He replaced uh, Peter, the aria uh, sung uh, in conjunction with Peter's denial, Ach mein Sinn, with a new piece, Zerschmerdernisch. He replaced Betachte meine Seele and Avega Avega with an aria, that's a recit and a, an aria, with an aria, Ach findet euch nicht so. And then in one place where there hadn't been an interpolation before, um, an insertion in the gospel text, he adds a movement, Himmelreise, Welt der Bebe. So, um, some substitutions, I have those in red, and one insertion. Um, I'll add here that it turns out that very recently we've been able to document um, this second version of the piece. Nobody had ever seen a printed um, libretto or even a kind of reproduced, republished printed libretto for the St. John Passion. Uh, but a scholar in Germany, uh, Christina Blanken, um, recognized in this print from 1728 from the town of Nuremberg, um, published by uh, the author is Christoph Birkmann, uh, who had been a theology student in Leipzig, noticed that in this printed collection, 
is an oratorio about um, the death of Jesus. And you can see that it begins with O Mensch Bewein dann Sünde Gross. And then here's the here's gospel narrative. Um, and then on the next page, uh, here's a chorale, O Grosse Lieb, and more narrative, a chorale, Dein Wilgesche, and then an aria, a Misch vom Stück am Sünden. Of course, this is version two of the St. John Passion. It's a very complicated question of what it's doing in that collection. The best guess, given the conventions of the time, is that this guy, Christoph Berkman, was responsible for um, the libretto, at least of the second version of the St. Matthew Passion, perhaps rewriting these, um, these new texts. He seems to be taking credit for it um, in a publication of his sacred poetic writings. Uh, lots of questions come out of that. We're going to have to leave that aside um, for the moment. But you can look at um, uh, Blankman's really insightful writings about this. So let's look a little bit at that substitution of the first movement. It begins with Herr unser Herrscher dessen Ruhm in 1724, um, a text beginning, Lord, our ruler, whose praise is glorious in all the lands. And um, here is that the opening of that text. It's a poem, um, but it's based on, it's a para poetic paraphrase of Psalm 8, uh, Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth, which incidentally Martin Luther writes, out, writes about in great detail, uh, understanding it as a messianic prophecy. Um, so to the Lutheran listener, the poetic um, opening of the 1724 St. John Passion would have, was citing a, a psalm that um, Lutheran interpretation called prophetic. So that's actually quite a splendid text, uh, Lord, our ruler who is praising glorious is, and glorious is all the lands. And if I were to tell you, for example, that when Bach set this to music, he, he wrote this music for it, you'd say, that's plausible. And you can imagine the chorus coming in um, in this trumpet and drums piece, Herr unser Herrscher, Lord our ruler, whose praise is glorious in all the lands. Now, you know the St. John Passion, and you know it doesn't begin why that's the opening of Cantata 130 as it, as it happens. Um, but there are lots of celebratory trumpets and drums uh, Bach pieces that begin with a psalm text or a psalm paraphrase. Um, uh, as you know, in fact, this is the um, opening of the uh, St. John Passion. And if and it sounds very different, I'll play it in just a second. But if you squint at it, and here I'll squint for you on the, on the screen, um, from a distance, all that circulating 16th note motion, this could be quite a festive piece, right? Except that this is what it actually sounds like. <laughs> would say there's not just a clash, but there's an explicit contradiction between the um, words of praise in the text and all the emblems of sorrow and suffering um, that are in this musical excerpt. The minor mode, the suspension chains between uh, the two top woodwind lines, uh, the, all the changing harmonies over the um, pedal, uh, pedal point G and so on. An explicit clash between the musical substance and the text. Um, this is intentional. And in fact, it, this clash and this contrast comes up again and again and again in the St. John Passion text. So I have some examples here. Um, a little bit later in this very text, it, addressing Jesus, it says that um, we note that even in the lowest abase, the greatest abasement, you are glorified. Um, in the chorale, I lived in the world um, with joy, but you must suffer. Um, in the alto aria, to unbind me from the um, fetters of my sins, my Savior lets himself be bound, right? Um, and then the central piece, in many ways, of the uh, of central movement of all the Stein Gefängnis, Gottes Sohn must uns die Freiheit kommen, from your imprisonment, God's Son, freedom must come to us, and then especially your prison cell is the throne of mercy, right? Um, and so these contradictions run um, all the way through. And this is a theological understanding of the passion story. 
uh, nicely summarized by the phrase, the paradoxical glorification in Jesus' abasement on the cross, right? And that's what's going on here musically uh, in, in Herr unser Herrscher, right? Is that the text is saying one splendid thing, but the music is pointing out that there's suffering in the eyes of the believer uh, going on with it. So what's it replaced with in 1725? A very different piece, O Mensch bewein dein Sünde groß, um, we heard an excerpt of it, of it opening Redonello uh, a little while ago. Um, this is the first stanza of a hymn. It's one of these hymns that goes on for many stanzas uh, meant for the passion season that narrates at great length and in great detail the events of the passion story. So this opening stanza sort of summarizes um, a theological view of the passion story and prepares you as the listener or as the singer of the hymn, because these were sung in uh, full all stanzas when they, when they were sung as congregational hymns, which is not really what's going on in a passion. This is a nice introductory stanza to um, the a setting of the passion. And it says, oh, humankind, bewail your great sin. That is the opening line. It is asking humankind, the believer in this case, to um, bewail great sin that is in turn responsible for Jesus' suffering and death um, in this theological view. Um, you know this piece probably. Uh, you'll recognize it here from Bach's 1736 autograph, fair copy of the St. Matthew Passion. Um, this piece um, Bach uh, added to the St. Matthew Passion in 1736 when he went back and made some revisions uh, of the work that originated in 1727. This is the closing number of part one. Originally, that closing number was a simple four-part chorale, and Bach inserts O Mensch bewein dein Sünde groß, a piece he had on hand because he had composed it to be a new opening movement for um, the 1725 second version of the St. John Passion. Uh, you'll find in the literature a claim that um, it actually predates 1725. Um, the philological evidence doesn't really seem to bear that out. It looks like a new composition for 1725 uh, to me and, uh, and to others. So Bach replaces the opening a paradoxical glorification and abasement chorus, Erwin's Erhelscher, with a, a text, a, a chorale text that calls on humankind to consider its own sinfulness. What else gets changed? Um, one of the other things get changed is that the um, tenor aria Ach mein Sinn is replaced. Uh, this is a piece that um, we hear just after the moment of Peter's denial of Jesus. Um, oh, my sense of implied probably good and evil. Where do you want to go? Where, how shall I restore myself? Um, and this is full of 18th century emblems of uh, the distraught and the distracted and the, um, and the tormented and the troubled. <laughs> Also combines the idea of lament. It's got the chromatically descending lamento bass uh, at the opening and at the vocal entrance. This piece is replaced in 1725 with a different piece. Tell schmettert mich your felsen und your hügel, crush me you rocks and you hill and you hills. Um, heaven cast your thunderbolt upon me. A reference to um, uh, statements in the gospel attributed to Peter calling on rocks and hills to crush him in. Uh, retribution for the thing he has done. Um, here is uh, the opening of that replacement piece. <laughs> Now, there's an unfortunate tendency um, uh, for modern performances on the ca rare occasion you get to hear this piece uh, to treat it as what you might think of as musically bouncy. But this, in fact, was understood to be the exact opposite. This piece is full of all the conventions um, that the early 18th century um, musical world um, used to illustrate violence and anger and rage. And that's in reflection, of course, of the text, Crush Me, You Rocks and You Hills, Heaven cast your thunderbolt 
upon me. This goes straight back to Claudio Monteverdi and material in the eighth book of Madrigals, the so-called concitato genere, the musical representation that Monteverdi invents as a way to express anger and warlike sentiments. And so this is a very different um, approach to this moment in the story. Instead of um, Peter's tortured lament, here is uh, an aria of, uh, aria of violence, uh, not strictly speaking Peter, but in response to this moment for Peter. Um, so a very different theological understanding and interpretation, very different guidance for the listener to how to understand that element of the story. Um, this has some interesting consequences. Um, in 1724, um, this, uh, this, the original aria, Ach mein Sinn, follows the gospel narrative, the scriptural narrative in which the evangelist says, and Peter thought about what Jesus has said and went out and wept bitterly, und weinte bitterlich. And you can hear, for example, in that lament bass with which it, Ach mein Sinn opens, you can hear um, elements of that, um, that understanding. Um, if you think about it, though, that's a terrible way to introduce. That doesn't make a lot of sense. Or, or crush me, you rocks and you hill is not really uh, what you'd expect to follow. And Peter went out and cried bitterly. And in fact, in the 1725 performance, that line was of gospel was eliminated. It says um, Peter denied him again, and all of a sudden the cock crowed. And then you get sashmetot mich. Well, you can ask yourself. What made Bakken of the Breddest think that it was okay to eliminate a line of scripture in telling the story? And the answer is that, that line is not originally in John's gospel. It's a borrowing either from Mark's gospel or, or Matthew's gospel um, the, um, that gets inserted. So if you think about it for a minute, um, the, one of the reasons you might say that they inserted these words um, in the 1724 version, was to be able to insert an aria like, Ach, like Ach mein Sinn, but for a different theological interpretation, that line comes back out. Um, and so two very different, um, uh, two very different interpretations of that, of that moment. Um, so there's that replacement. Um, there's another place where the gospel text got, um, uh, was tampered with or added to, this is the moment um, at, right after Jesus' death on the cross, and we hear, and behold, the veil of the temple was parted, uh, and the earth, there was an earthquake, and the rocks split asunder, and the graves opened, and bodies of saints arose. And this is the, this is the famous moment in which... <laughs> that that goes well beyond the relatively neutral narr narration of it, and then Jesus said, and so on. Um, interestingly enough, that's another passage um, in which the John does, gospel does not relate the description of the cataclysms. And in 1724, um, Bach and his librettist inserted one line about that and see the uh, veil of the temple um, uh, ripped in two from top to bottom, and then they go on with the story. In 1725, they amplified that further. This is either from Mark or Matthew, depending on how you want to interpret. They um, amplified that further in 1725, added even more description of the earthquake and the rock splitting and the body of the saints rising. Um, and so this was an another moment in which they added to the gospel text by borrowing from other gospels in 1725. And we know this because in the 1724 continuo part, remember we've got one continuo part that survives from that very first version, um, there's this very short um, uh, evangelist recitative, which gets expanded to this in 1725. We don't know what the vocal line looked like at that point. We don't have it. Uh, another change that gets made is that in 1724, um, we have the recit aria pair, betrachte meine Seele, and Elvega, wie sein Blut gefärbt Rücken. This is at the moment that Jesus has been whipped, has been scorched, and this is a recit and aria reaction to that. That gets replaced um, with a single movement, an aria, ach, windet euch nicht so geplagte Seelen, do not writhe so, you tormented souls, because of your fear of the cross and the sorrow. And that, that change is made as well. And then, um, 
uh, finally, uh, at the end, this is the original ending chorale of the 1724 St. John Passion, O Lord, let your dear angels at the very end carry my soul to Abraham's bosom. That gets replaced with um, this, another, a different chorale, Christi du Lamb Gottes, Christ, you Lamb of God, who bears the sins of the world, have mercy on us, repeated more or less three times, or the last time, grant us your peace. That's the German poetic hymn version of the Agnus Dei. But notice that this change means that the 1725 version begins with a instruction to humankind to bewail its great sin, and then ends with an appeal um, to Jesus um, who bears the sin of the world to have mercy on us. This is a passion framed by movements that are about human sinfulness, as opposed to one that, that is focused on this paradoxical glory of Jesus, even in the abasement of crucifixion. And it's really important that the framing movements of a passion are really important in guiding the theological um, understanding of the piece that's meant to be communicated. So that doesn't account for everything that changed in 1725, but it's, the, it's some of the principal changes. Principal changes in version three of the piece. Um, it put back the original opening movement, Herr or Hausha, and put back that recit aria pair, Betachtem and Zale and Viga. It takes out that extra um, inserted uh, aria, and it removes um, that replacement ending chorale. And what you end up with um, is the first part of the piece, more or less as in version one, except that once again, the aria at the moment of Peter's denial is replaced and it's not Achmein Zinn, the original piece, and it's not Tashmetot Mish, the one from 1725. It's a third aria, which we don't have. All the inserted material that was put in the parts for this, as it happens, every one of them is gone. So we do not know what aria um, went there. And then remember I showed you that transposition of that chorale. It's probable this aria was in some key where a G major chorale made more sense than an A major chorale following it. So that's where that transposition came from. Um, and then um, uh, the second part of the piece is mostly as in version one, but um, except for um, one of the um, movements, the cat, in fact, the description of the cataclysms at Jesus's death, instead of that and that description, that comes out and a symphonia, a purely instrumental piece was inserted. We don't have a scrap from that either. And that would be extraordinary to, to hear, to know what kind of instrumental piece um, Bach put in that moment, which was a convention in the early 18th century, to um, sometimes forego words and at a particularly evocative and effective moment to use an instrumental symphonia. We don't have that. And then as far as we can tell, it ended with the chorus, there was no, no concluding chorale written in the parts. So um, here's a, another diagram showing what kind of thing changed in 1730. Most of the changes made in 1725 are undone. Um, and uh, a lost now lost symphonia and the lost aria are put in. Um, it's worth pointing out what moments they're tampering with, they're adjusting. The opening, the exordium, the call to attention, and the closing, we talked about those as framing numbers and their importance. The moment of Peter's denial and his weeping or his um, violent anguish, Jesus' scourging, the whipping, and the reaction to that, and the cataclysms after Jesus' death on the cross. And these three moments are among the most affected, the most emotionally laden of the entire passion narrative. And it's worth noting that in Bach's setting of the evangelist narrative, these are the three places where the evangelist um, doesn't simply narrate and report in something that could sound like recitative out of a cantata or an opera, but in fact, um, und weinet um, bitterlich goes on at great chromatic length um, and the description of Jesus being scourged is um, violently descriptive, described and illustrated by voice and continuo. And between voice and continuo, we've already heard how the cataclysms are, um, are depicted. And so it's really not so surprising that these are the places on which the, in which the um, revisions from one version of this piece to another are concentrated. Um, here's a new viola da gamba part that Bach makes um, for the only movement in this part, by the way, um, is the uh, alto aria, is this Fulbracht? Some very interesting questions come up about this part. He also makes a new organ part um, to uh, play the restored Betachtem and Zeal 
in place of the lute that originally played it and so on. And that organ part is interesting because it's one of the very few Bach organ parts we had that's got a registration indication in it. Um, uh, wird auf der Orgel mit acht und vier Fuß gedeckt gespielt, to be played on the organ with an eight and four foot gedeckt stop. So we even know the registration he was calling for in this case. All right, the piece comes out again in 1740, comes off the shelf again in 1749, and there's another round of revisions. Um, it looks very much like um, version one, Herr unser Herrscher is still in, Ach mein Sinn, the original aria at the Peter moment is back, Betrachte meine Seele and der Vega are back in, and this aria, mein Herz, um, and Sarflisa and Reset that had been cut out in the moment after Jesus' death, those are back. Um, and then so is the concluding chorale. So in many ways, this piece looks a lot like the 1724 version, at least in terms of the, num the particular movements in their order. Um, but there are some other interesting changes, especially in changes in the text. He kept the arias, uh, some of the arias, but changed their text. Um, here's an uh, example. Uh, the soprano aria, Ich folge dir gleichfalls mit freudigen Schritten, gets changed. Instead of, I'll follow you likewise with joyful steps, it becomes, I'll follow you likewise, my savior with joy, and then some um, other changes in the text here. Um, it's easier to see what kind of change Bach is making by looking at the retexted versions of Betrachte meine Seele. Um, so in the original version of Betrachte meine Seele, it says, it describes this, for I think the modern listener, a very Baroque and potentially disturbing images that the wounds on Jesus, from the wounds on Jesus's head caused by the crown of thorn grow um, key of heaven flowers and hyssop, um, sort of from the blood, from the bloody wound. And that gets, that gets changed um, to something um, uh, much less graphic. Um, hyssop blooms for your guilt. Jesus' blood is sprinkled on you for purification, much, much less uh, direct. And then here, um, the aria El Vega, which is, um, uh, follows that and is, again, at the moment of Jesus scourging, the original imagery of that aria says, um, look at the horrible wounds on Jesus' back from having been whipped. Aren't they like a rainbow? I mean, that's a very odd, very Baroque image. And that gets toned way down. Instead of note how his um, uh, bloodstained black brings back, brings you a, a thousand joys. It says, oh, Jesus, your agonizing and suffering um, brings me joys. Um, it's a little less graphic. So some of these texts are changed. What else did he do in 1749? Well, he still had, for example, the two copies of violin one. So there are the two copies, one from 1724 and one remade in 1725. He makes a third copy of violin one. Now it's a whole separate set of questions. How many violinists did Bach expect to play from a part? you won't be surprised that the pretty clear answer, demonstrable answer, is one player on each part, unlike the modern practice of desks and shared parts. But he makes an additional violin one part. Um, we know we still had these, and these have been marked up so they can be used in version four of the piece. So however many violinists he used earlier, he used more in 1749. He still had his viola part from 1725. He makes a second copy of it. However many violas he used, one as it turns out, you can deduce, he used more, two as it turns out. Here are two new basso continuo parts, both marked harpsichord, cembalo. This one has figures in it, mean, meaning pretty clearly that um, harmonized basso continuo in 1749 was played on the harpsichord, presumably rather than the organ. This is an additional continuo part. It's marked cembalo, it's marked harpsichord too, but I don't think it's also a harpsichord part. I think this is an, uh, an assistant copyist assigned to make a duplicate of this, and he takes it too literally and heads it. Cembalo, this was intended for a melodic instrument. Um, he takes one of his original continuo parts and he reworks it for bassono grosso, meaning either contrabassoon or just bassoon. That's not 100% clear. And I wanna point out that what that principally means is marking tacit, don't play in some movements. So he adds bassoon to this performance, but selectively. It becomes effectively a piano instrument to reinforce uh, big numbers um, there. Um, now, here's where things get really naughty. We've seen these four versions of the piece represented by the state of these performing parts at four different times in Bach's career in Leipzig. 
Um, but we need to go back and think about the score again for just a moment. So here, once again, is the title page, uh, the first page, rather, of music of that autograph score that Bach starts in 1739. And here's that moment I showed you before, 10 leaves in, 20 pages in, um, in which the copyist, Baumler, takes over and starts copying. Um, that shouldn't make much difference to us, except that Bach being Bach, when he is recopying this piece, he is not just recopying. He is recomposing, he is revising, he is making changes and in what he must have thought of as improvements to the piece as he goes. So from this page to this one here, the one that Bach copies, what we have is a revision of what must have been in the original composing score. But when Baumler takes over, he doesn't have the temerity to start rewriting uh, Bach's passion. He has no way to do it. He just copies what's there. So this score starts in 1739 with Bach revising the first 10 numbers or so, and then continues in about 1749 with Baumler literally copying. So we have a revised version of the first 10 numbers of the, of the piece. And you can see some of the differences. I put them side by side here. Here's that opening chorus. Principally the difference here, the one we might note most, is there's one um, bass line here, but in the revised version, Bach distinguishes between what um, cellos are going to play, that's the stems up eighth notes, and what the um, violona and organ are gonna play, that's the stem down quarter notes every other beat. Dum, dum. Um, and that's a, that's a detail, but the thing is full of details like that. Um, here's the chorale number five, Dein Wilgesche Herr Gott zugleich. This is the original version that Bach composes in 1724. And here is the revised version of the piece when he recopies it, um, he revises it. This is, um, and you can see just from the amount of black and, sm and small notes that this is much more involved. This has many more passing tones um, more suspension dissonances and so on. This is a, um, a clearly more um, involved, let's call it involved chorale style. It's very much like the style, I would say, that we've come to expect of chorales in the Christmas Oratorio compared to the chorales that we find in the cantatas from the early 17, in the 1720s. So he revises the chorales as he goes. So how did, why is this important? Well, here's a diagram summarizing what we discovered about the parts. In 1724, he performs what we've now come to call version one. He must have copied out a complete set. We don't have the whole thing, but there must have been one or he couldn't perform the piece. Only a few parts remain because he retained them. 1725, a new version by copying out a bunch of new parts and making revisions in the 1724 parts. Performs it again around 1730, mostly by making revisions in those earlier parts. We've seen a couple of, of small additions. And then in 1749, version four, by making a few new parts, but mostly revisions in earlier parts. So it's, um, if you look at Bach de Gital, for example, as I think Joshua mentioned in his introductory um, note, it, if you say, show me version one, it will show you just those few remaining parts of version one. If you say, show me version two, it will show you the parts that were new in version two. But of course, if what you want to know is what was used in version two, it was these from this version and those there. And again, in 1730, it's pretty much everything that existed before in 1749. So the readings in version one and version two get passed down all the way to 1749. Why is that important? Because our score recopying process fits in the middle. Bach's revisions in 1739, all those changes um, that are so interesting in which he improves, I guess, in his mind, um, exist only in the score. They never find their way into performing parts. How do we know? Well, we can look at all the parts used in 1749 and they don't reflect the changes in the score. Now that's interesting because it raises the question, well, you might say, what's our definition of a version? I would say a good definition of a version is the form in which the piece was heard under box direction. And as far as we know now, and there's starting to be some interesting questions about whether we fully understand it, as far as we know now, um, there were four such versions. And we can do a pretty good job at defining what it sounded like in 1725 and 1749. We know a lot about what it sounded like in 1730, uh, although, of course, we're missing a couple of the substitute movements. But we know what else went on. Um, version one is not so complete, of course, but we can do a lot of reconstructing of it. Um, we, we know, but they all contain the material that must have been in Bach's composing score. 
1724, and do not take into account the revisions Bach made of the first two numbers. Um, that's really interesting because we don't tend to hear these versions. And so my point was, it's a question by our definition of what a version is of whether these revisions in 1739, or partial revision, because Bach only got 10 numbers in, is that a version of the St. John Passion? Or maybe it's a partial version. Or since nobody um, in Bach's lifetime ever heard it, um, what attention do we give it? What do we tend to hear now? Well, we tend to hear now um, a version based on the score edited by Arthur Mendel, who was the brilliant editor of this piece for the uh, critical edition, for the new Bach edition, and from a vocal score he produced that's by far the most widely used over the years, derived from it. What does it have? Well, for, num uh, for numbers one through 10, it uses the revised readings from Bach's autograph score, these here, right? But then, because we don't have any revisions after that, it switches to the only other version we have, the one that's in Baumler's score and that's in all those parts. It largely reflects um, what's in version four, including the addition of Bassono Grosso, you'll find that cued in there, but it retains certain features of version one. Um, it's got the old text of those arias, not that revised text I showed you. And it uses, for example, the very special instrumentation of number 19 with that uh, Batak de Minazel with lute and viola de more, as opposed to harpsichord and muted violin, which is what Bach did in 1749, or as opposed to um, violins and organ, which Bach did in uh, 1730. So it's a composite. It's a, arguably a pastiche. And this has become known as the traditional version of the St. John Passion. And it's important to remember that tradition here means um, late 20th century tradition to the point that you can see this is the um, edition um, by Peter Volney for Karos, the German publisher, and it even calls it the traditional version 1739 slash 1749. Um, even that's not exactly what this is, but notice that that term traditional version is there in print. From Carus, you can also get um, editions that um, give you what the piece sounded like in 1725 and in 1749. Right? Um, so which St. John Passion? Well, we can reconstruct pretty clearly 1725 and 1749. We've got a decent idea about 1724, but plenty of, plenty of gaps, especially in, in instrumentation. Um, uh, 1730, we're missing the things that make it most distinctive, that missing aria and that symphonia. Um, and then there's the question of the version that's in Bach's revised first part of the autograph score. Which St. John Passion? One has to make a decision. And the decision that has tended to be made was this compromise. Now, to be fair, um, this version works really nicely. Uh, it's musically coherent in many ways. But of course, in multiple senses, it conforms to absolutely nothing Bach ever performed or his listeners and uh, congregants ever heard. So before the downbeat, since that's the theme here, we have to ask which St. John Passion are we performing? How are we gonna define a version of the piece? Do we care about doing a version, um, strictly speaking? And if so, which one are we going to do? So this turns out to be a, a multi-part question. Um, and you have to think about these things before you can even start to think about the issues that Joshua was talking about, about how you're going to staff this thing. So. We're raising more and more questions about what this piece is and was in the 18th century, but I figured that's why we're here. Thank you. I think there's a few minutes left in our session to, um, for comments and discussion from the panel or questions we can take. I'll let Brett, well, it looks like Joshua, your, your microphone is on. Oh, <coughs> many many fascinating points and i hope we'll return to them in the afternoon i'll just if i may make one small uh with reluctance correction i think to one thing about the 1725 version and omen Bavine. um namely you are right that the movement must not have originated before 1725 but the philological evidence um, indicates that it was not composed for the St. John Passion. This is a real problem there. It was written in D major, not E flat. 
And this has, of course, given rise to lots of uh, head scratching. And I think the current answer is that this was meant to be the first movement of a new passion setting. After all, he had done the St. John Passion a year before, and it's not customary to repeat such a piece one year later. And that something happened to prevent him from completing this, maybe the librettist died, that's one um, speculation that's out there. And so he had to fold some of this into the St. John Passion, um, in part as he's doing it to cover his tracks. Now, what's interesting is that I'll have to say here in your exposition of this, it makes the thing a lot more respectable than I had been inclined it, uh, to regard it as being. So you may have, again, Bach making, making lemonade, if you will, but there does seem to be something of a crisis situation behind the 1725 version. Yeah, that, that makes sense. Uh, if that is the explanation, it means postulating the plan for a different passion. And um, there's been so much, so many attempts to hypothesize Bach passions that might not actually exist that, that uh, I'm extra cautious about, uh, about that. Certainly it was composed around the time of the 1725 version of the well, you want, the one thing on that is true. There are the, the woodwork is thick with fictive Bach passions, um, and interestingly, this possible passion was never contemplated. But it's whatever what, whatever the story is, we do have to find an explanation for his composing homage to Vine in D major, rather than and everything else is indeed speculation, as you say. And as for covering his tracks, presumably we might by reperforming a St. John Passion yeah. a, a year after, if we assume that the expectation was something new and we don't really, we don't really know that, mm -hmm. um, it's interesting to ask, what did he need to do to cover his tracks? Well, if you frame the piece with different movements, with a different theological perspective, okay. as we've seen, and you replace the interpolated commentary movements at the moments that are apparently most valued and, and uh, in, in Leipzig, well, in some ways you have made a new passion. Absolutely. And so they both happen to be John's gospel, so we call them versions of the St. John passion. But there's a sense, apparently enough of a sense, that this is a new passion that Bach can get away with it, if that's the right way to think about this. Yeah, um, and certainly as prompted by this symposium, I started thinking more about the 1725 new movements and what they add, what they, how they change the theological focus. And even if the decision ended up, even if the genesis of this passion were hasty, um, it was not, not remotely um, ill-considered in lots of ways because the, as Dan points out, the new framing movements really focus on um, the consequences of sin, why this all had to happen, which is kind of the, the thrust of every passion, but this one in particular, um, the 1725 version, when the two inserted new movements after Peter's denial, the entire last chunk of the first half is now uh, reflections on discipleship. Um, Peter's betrayal and um, the focus of the new arias is changing it to how the listener is supposed to understand that they too have betrayed Jesus in their own lives and what that, what the consequence of that betrayal is. And it's, it's really um, a, a very dense focus for that whole second half of the first, um, of the first um, part. And it becomes a very different piece in that way. And then because of the theological topics that the new arias cover, the um, number 19 gets chucked out. Um, the, we get, ach, windet euch nicht so instead of Erwege and um, Betrachte mein Seele, because he ends up covering that theological material in the new movements that he puts into the first half. He doesn't cover, so he had to actually think about that. It wasn't like, oh, geez, I gotta, I gotta throw some new arias in here or I'm gonna get busted. It was, it was, it was I think that was very much more um, calculated than that, even though personally I find the 1725 new movements to be less satisfying than the ones he ultimately went back to. Well, it has to be said, Bach did too. Um, yeah, right. When he got the chance, he reverted basically to the predecessors. It's, yeah. 
I think it becomes apparent why too. I mean, honestly, there's one area I've been sort of bugging both um, Dan and Joshua about this, but the, yeah. the Himmelreise, which becomes um, the 11th, the movement number 11 interpolated. Um, it's very confusing to me as a piece of music. It's weird. It's weird because it's a kind of, it's a continual aria that then gets an embedded cantus firmus plus two flauti traversi. Right. And the texture of it is honestly baffling to me. I don't get it. And the traversi get buried because it's a continual aria, but, but what it actually accomplishes in a way structurally, if we're giving it some credit is to add a fourth iter or another iteration of the same chorale tune mm -hmm. of the um, Jesu Leiden Pein und Tod. We get to hear that melody four times in the 1725 version. So it almost becomes like we talk about a passion chorale for the Matthew. If the 1725 version of the St. John, if we, it's said to have a chorale, this is, this might be an argument for that kind of functionality, but I don't know. I haven't thought my way all the way through it, but it also does correspond with the chorale cantata's yargong. I don't know. Um, it's, it's something that I've been puzzling about as we've been thinking about this. And I wonder how um, others who have dealt with this longer than I have think through this particular version because it's it's not, not not everybody might know what the choral cantata yargon is so if i could just very briefly explain the series of cantatas that bach had composed um starting from trinity sunday of 1724 no yeah 1724 going to should go to trinity 1725 um all shared a common feature in their librettos and largely in the music namely that the libretto of each cantata was based on a chorale, which is quoted literally in the first movement and again in the last movement, but paraphrased into different verse, into arias and recitatives in between. And Bach sets the first movement as a big um, chorus using the cantus firmus of the chorale, ends with a simple chorale. And one of the interesting circumstantial features that, that plays into the 1725 St. John Passion is that this cycle continues with absolute consistency until Good Friday. Uh, the last cantata before Good Friday is like this, and when cantatas resume at Easter time, they're different. So it's as if something interrupted his cycle that was a very consistent plan. So it, that, that's one of the reasons I think why people speculate that he was indeed planning a somehow chorale passion at the time. It's hmm. an interesting thought. Um, we have maybe a few more minutes because we started a little late. So if we want to spend another five minutes or so, there were um, a lot of interesting questions that came from the uh, from the attendees um, during that. And a few of them are very, uh, multiple questions interested in the lute, um, gamba, the lute and gamba parts and their relationship to continuo and how that may have changed throughout the versions. Um, and so obviously that could be a whole one hour panel session itself. But um, I don't know if we, if we would just want to spend a few minutes working through that a little, little bit, that'd be great. I'll start and then I know this is a subject in which Josh was, to which Josh was given a lot of thought. Um, the lute and the gamba in the 1724 version, the only one in which we know they both participated, um, or yeah, we know they both participated, are special instruments. They are the kind of instruments that are dropped in for special effect for one movement each. Um, and uh, we don't have um, lute or gamba part from 1724. All we have is that replacement gamba part from 1730, but to judge from that part, the only thing the viola da gamba did was play in um, the alto aria Esis Fulbraut. It played the, um, the obligato line in its Ritornello aria, and then apparently the, an addition, um, a revision in 1730 is that it shadows the voice line in the B section there, Halle, Zura, um, Sieg mit Mach. Um, there's nothing else in that part. And there's no indication that it was, would have played continuo, largely because viola da gamba was not a continuo instrument in Bach's Leipzig church music, period. Um, for the lute, we don't have the original performing part from 1724, but from the score, it's pretty clear that what it plays is obbligato. Um, and there wouldn't have been figures uh, in there. 
there is, and I'll let Joshua pick this up, um, as he's pointed out, there is no evidence that Bach ever used a plucked instrument as for realizing continuo in his church music performances. And there are a couple of other places. Harpsichord occasionally, sorry. Uh, I mean, yeah. handheld plucked instruments as opposed to keyboard plucked, plucked instruments. Um, was the practice in other churches in, in Leipzig, in the new, new church, they um, used one of a couple of different uh, uh, big continuo lutes, uh, Chalcedon, for example. Um, but there's no evidence that Bach ever did. If you look at the other places um, in which we I suppose it could have happened, the most famous is the mourning piece for Queen Christina Everhardina, the so-called Trauer Oda. It, there's really actually no evidence that what they were doing in that piece was playing continuo, as again, Joshua has, has argued. So these are to be thought of as special coloristic obligato instruments dropped in to individual movements, not as part of the ensemble. Yeah, I um, th 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 thank you for the call out on that, Dan. And of course, I agree with you 100%. Um, it's, it's one of the sort of like urban legends that, that persists in early music. Uh, recently on YouTube, I, I actually saw a performance of the St. John Passion, or rather I saw about two minutes of it, which is all I really wanted to see. And there in the opening chorus was a big fiorbo playing, which in fact seems to have to be everywhere you do Baroque music nowadays. I love the fiorbo, I love the lute, but they have no place in this stuff. Um, and the, indeed, Bach's lute in the 1724 St. John Passion would not have been a theorbo. It would have been a much smaller lute, very likely a particular kind of lute tuned in flat side tunings rather than the one we normally think of as a lute. But in any event, um, it is true that we do not have the parts for 1724, so we cannot say absolutely the lute did not participate in anything but that movement. But every time we can establish this, these, these things are, as Dan says, special instruments. On the gamba, I might mention, we have the same situation with the St. Matthew Passion and the recit and aria, consusus coits. Um, and again, we have a part that just contains those numbers and nothing else. Um, these bad habits, if I may call them that, grow from looking at modern scores thinking a that scores are the embodiment of the piece and b that there was a lot of freedom in these matters in the baroque period and these are notions of which one can readily disabuse oneself if one studies the parts that people actually used as dan also stresses so i hate to say this um i have accompanied monteverdi's l'orfeo with two uh, theorbos throughout and none of the other instruments people use. I love the instrument, but sorry, in Bach it has no place. Yeah. And it's worth, it's worth reiterating that we're not suggesting that, you know, fretted plucked instruments were not used for continuo, you know, right. around 1724 or 1725. Be what we're asking here is, was that part of Bach's Leipzig concerted church music practice which we have documented in sets of performing parts in, in great detail? And the answer is no. no. I mean, in fact, in Dresden, in Dresden, a theorbo is part of the church music ensemble regularly. We know this from the parts that survive and even markings in Zelenka's autograph scores, etc. But Dresden isn't Leipzig. The, the notion down the block, as I said, down the block in the Neuk at the Neuk. Also down that strange instrument. They're, use, they're using, there it is. Does, did it happen? Yes. Did Bach do it? No, from the evidence we have, apparently not. Yes, again, we've grown up with a notion that is a kind of one-size-fits-all Baroque performance style and kinds of scoring. And um, it's this kind of attention to really evidence that we have that, 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 that can disabuse us of that notion and see a much more variegated picture in which Bach is one of several elements, but is the element on which we're focused here. Yeah, and there's a, a one other way to think about it. Yeah. And that is you can see that when Bach writes out, when Bach composes a piece and writes a score, that's only the first stage in the presentation of that piece. The next stage in the hands of the person responsible for the performance is what we might call the realization of, of the piece. Now, in the case of the performances under Bach we're talking about, composer and director realizer are the same person. So what we're talking about here is not just how Bach performed the piece, but really might not be better to say, how did Bach realize the score? 
And we know what his practices were and, um, because we've got so much evidence on the question. When he sent the 1724 St. John Passion off somewhere else, if that's what happened, we're not sure, to somebody else who performed it, did they do it the way we're reconstructing in Leipzig? I can almost guarantee, without having seen any of this stuff, that they didn't because there are, lo there are local practices and conventions and you might even call it, well, in fact, traditions. What we're talking about is what we can document about what Bach's practices were in realizing pieces like this and this piece. This, this brings us to sort of like back to a dilemma that has become very unfashionable in recent years, namely the distinction between reception and practical reception and, dare I use that term, composer's intention, or at least what the composer is envisaging in the act of composition and in the first performances that the composer directs. Well, great. Um, I think we're at time, although we, we are lucky to have another hour to go in, in any number of directions um, after our break. Um, so I'd like to invite, um, invite you to send your questions, if you haven't already, to uh, cems at bu.edu. We'll post a little slide with that on there. Um, and we'll reconvene at 2.30 p.m. Eastern Time. Um, also, just a quick note, uh, because we weren't able to have a chat feature for the attendees, um, I've set up a Facebook group within the CEMS page um, that is open to participants in the seminar. Um, so you'll be receiving an email invitation to that. So feel free to join that group and talk with each other or post things that you find interesting, um, because we're sorry that this format doesn't accommodate that as neatly, um, even though we're happy to see what you have to say to us. Um, and we'll also try to get to some of these other questions um, over the break or in the afternoon session. But again, we invite you to please uh, send those questions our way um, in, by, by email, and we will um, work them into our afternoon session as, as best as we can. But even though we're a little late here, we'll still plan to resume at 2.30 uh, Eastern time for the final session. Um, so thank you, uh, Professor Malamed, for that very illuminating um, exposition on these many issues. And um, thank you, Ellen and Joshua, for your discussion afterwards. And we're looking forward to more discussion with everyone um, after the break. So uh, thank you all. All right, welcome back, everybody. Hope you enjoyed your lunch or your breakfast or whatever meal your time zone <laughs> implied. Um, we are gearing up here to resume with our panel discussion um, with uh, Josh Orkin, Daniel Muhammad, and Ellen Exner. I mean, so thank you so much for all your questions that have been flowing in via email and uh, the Q&A box. And we'll try to get to as many as possible. Obviously, um, it perhaps goes without saying we can't get to all of them, but we're going to do our best to at least touch on the issues that have come up um, in broad themes. Um, so I think we're going to start here with uh, one theme that sort of pervades any historical performance conversation, um, not least Bach and the St. John Passion and this issue of authenticity, um, because if we get into any specific conversations about what Bach maybe wanted or had, you have to start in the first place with whether that's a question worth asking at all. So that's perhaps a good place to start. Um, <clears throat> and so, so uh, kind of coming out where we ended in the previous session, I'll maybe turn it over to Dan Elna Joshua to um, to sort of talk about this question of, you know, where 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 the authenticity is located, if it's located anywhere, and how we go about wrangling with that as performers today. Ellen, will you start with that? Uh, sure. It's obviously it's a very um, thorny topic and has received a lot of attention. Um, what it always comes down to the more I think about it is authenticity of our own intention, because we can't really know what box were, but we can know what ours are. And there are all sorts of ways to realize these scores and performance, whether or not that's how it was done in Leipzig in box time is one question. But if that's, and if we're presenting a performance as though that's what we're doing, then that has to be what we're doing. But if that's not the, the claim, if it's we're performing Bach St. John Passion, we're going to do it with this many people and these many instruments, and I want four Thayorbos, 
as long as you're not claiming that that was box intention, then go for it. Um, as long as you're not invested in that particular sort of marketing strategy of pure authenticity, then you can realize a score in whatever way that you you want. Um, and that's where the, the rug comes in for me was when we have ensembles saying this is a this is an authentic performance of a piece and it but it, it isn't actually. Um, that's a little bit of that's kind of that's a dishonesty, but it's also if you're you're saying you're recreating something you, you aren't. Um, you can't recreate something, but you can realize it anew. Um, it again, it just it comes down to the on, the honesty of your own intention. Like, what am I actually doing here? And being okay with that. It's like this is not necessarily what Bach did. This is what I'm going to do, and it's still beautiful. Um, I, I, if I may jump in, first of all, I very much appreciate you using the word honesty there, Helen. Um, <coughs> early music, the world in which I earn a most of my living, I guess, or have for a long time, um, is playing on an implicit authority, even if it does not say it is doing you know, the real thing. It is implying that it's built up that cultural position. Um, the fact is that, of course, a lot of it really is not, as you recognize, um, meeting that self-advertised standard, one could say. Uh, that said, I actually am very little for myself personally, and I can only address this personally, um, I am very little interested in re recreating what happened in Leipzig in 1724 or 1730. I mean, I'd be curious to have been there. Um, I'm actually a much more traditional work-centered performer, and I'm interested in a sense in what the work's demands are. What is the piece asking us? Um, and that's not necessarily a particularly early music view of things. Now, I do happen to believe, bolstered by experience, that um, Bach is fairly trustworthy. <laughs> you know, I, I imagine uh, some of you will have heard me say this before, the performance um, activity as a sort of dialogue between me and him. And I'm asking him, you know, what, what do you think? And I'll listen to his answers. Um, you know, and I think we're both pretty good musicians and he's probably a better musician than I am. So I'm gonna to want to, and he also wrote this stuff. So I'll give him the benefit of the doubt. And thus far, I've really not been convinced. But I think um, it's, if we're considering the aesthetic sides of it, it's very important to see it that way. In other words, you're absolutely right. And I agree with you that we can only do what we believe in what's our authentic thing. Um, as I often say, Bach's dead, we're not. On the other hand, um, I think that already opens a multitude of possibilities, and I'm hardly claiming that the possibilities that I favor are the only ones. Um, and as you say, honesty is perhaps a very, very important criterion here. Um, it, pardon me, Dan, is it okay, Dan, if I pick up on that? Um, I think, Whatever choices we make as as performers, there there just there are just con there are different consequences that come from those choices. If you want to privilege the traditional sort of concert hall setting where you have soloists up front and a big choir in the back, then you're going to gain some things and lose some things. If you want to use um, modern instruments or historical replica instruments, you're going to gain some things and you're going to lose some things. And it's just it's a matter of sort of thinking through what those changes are and what those choices what the result of those choices are, but then you have to think about the work. What is the work asking? What do I believe this work is? And with Bach, that can be a very difficult question because especially with sacred works in a very secular world, if you think the meaning of the work is in its theology, or if you think the meaning of the work is on its, at a purely aesthetic level, if you think the meaning of the work is a grandiose gesture, that you're gonna make different performance choices, I would think. Um, there are gains and losses with one part per person and gains and losses with multiple parts per people. It's just what do you want of this work? What do you believe it is? And what is the most, the most honest way you can think of for yourself of presenting it? Exactly. I mean, again, I'll just have to say for me, I really don't see any gains in modern instruments. I don't see any gains in the modern chorus. I see a gain in connecting possibly, and this is, by the way, someone uh, who conducted 
a revivalist St. Matthew Passion at the Three Choirs Festival in England, using the English text, using the piano continuo, um, using very much the parameters of a performance that was done there with Edward Elgar's participation in 1911. I love that sort of thing. Um, but that's, again, that's separating oneself from Bach, which I think one has to do no matter what. But if I'm considering, you know, the St. John Passion, let me be very blunt, I just don't see any point to the other stuff. Um, for me, it comes down to something that Zinuswald Kaukin said to me the first time we met and we're talking about this stuff. He just said, you know, the real reason for doing it is that it's so much more beautiful this way. Um, now, others can disagree. I'm not saying that that opinion has to count to everyone. And maybe we should hear what, forgive me if I put you on the spot, what the advantages you gain from the modern choir and modern instruments. But, well, but, one of the advantages is having a lot of people be able to participate in something that otherwise they wouldn't have access to. Hmm. And as long as that isn't presented as the authentic, the only, the singular version of Bach, I have zero problem with that and find a real beauty in participation. Yeah. Um, no, I'm there. I, I, I remember years ago in a, in a symposium on the St. Matthew Passion, and mm -hmm. it was really striking that every scholarly speaker at this symposium almost everybody started with an anecdote of their first encounter with this piece. And for the most part, it was singing in the chorus in a modern choral orchestral soloist performance. I mean, that's certainly how I got my starts. I mean, engaging with, with this repertory. Um, so as, uh, as Ellen um, said, I'm gonna, I'm gonna second that. There are educational and pedagogical and participatory reasons um, to do this. And for me, the, the only problem with them is that it sets a, a set of expectations about what the work is and how it works and what it does and how it achieves its effects. And to the point that, and this is the context for, which, um, for many of the reactions to performances that are in the size of Bachstaff, the way Bachstaff oh, if you scale it down to that size, you lose this, or it doesn't do that, or it loses its power, or it's not monumental. Well, that, those things might be true, but the starting point is the assumption is that what, that's what the piece is and was. Um, it, I'm just, sorry, I just want, um, th this raises maybe two specific questions or suggestions that were offered by a couple attendees that I think represent some widely held kind of main um, uh, more commonly held ideas about how to sort of on the one hand be historical but on the other hand maybe allow some expression and so in one case um, there's a, a, a fair argument was offered that Bach wanted the larger choir and so now that we have the ability to use the larger choir maybe we should um, and then because that represents Bach's intention, even if he was restricted by what was available to him. And then another suggestion that we received um, in the Q&A box was the idea of replacing um, in the place of the missing symphonia, um, some piece of instrumental music by Bach, um, just to select a different one um, in the idea that, you know, this is an opportunity to be expressive because we know Bach wrote something here, et cetera, et cetera. So maybe the, there's some um, sides to these. There's something in between, you know, it either being purely performer or purely historical and things start to get messy um, in that. Can I just say one thing about the Symphonia that I wanted to mention earlier? We actually know what the scoring of it was. It was a piece for two solo, for, for two violins and continuo. So that would narrow down our choice. Um, again, which piece is very much another question. Did Bach want a big choir? Of course he did. He also wanted the modern Steinway. He wanted the modern symphony orchestra. I mean, that, that's QED, isn't it? Um, what's interesting about that kind of question, actually, well, there are two things. First of all, that when we assume what somebody wanted beyond the, what they actually had, it's actually always the traditional thing that we know. What if Bach really wanted a quartet of saxophones for Art of Fugue, on which it sounds terrific, by the way? Um, you know, so our choices are very, very, very limited, very culture bound of what Bach would have wanted. The other thing that actually troubles me very much um, is the way we tend to treat Bach and early music in general as different from other music. 
you know, we don't talk about Beethoven in these ways. We don't talk about Wagner in these ways. We don't talk about Mahler, Schoenberg, Elliot Carter, Pierre Boulez, et cetera, in these ways. And I myself, and this is a personal prejudice, um, I'm very, 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 I have a big problem with separating Bach off in those ways, uh, which is not to minimize the wonders of participating in Bach. But, you know, we don't hear arguments about Beethoven symphonies. Well, you know, it's great when a bunch of us can sit down and play Beethoven's first together with whatever we've got, etc., which is also a great experience. But why is Bach separated from that? I might ask Dan if you can jump in on that because you've written some very eloquent things about the singularity of Bach in reception. Yeah, well, Bach plays a special role. And I mean, I'd be the first person to argue for the um, per special quality, exceptional qualities from many points of view of Bach's music. That's, that's what I've chosen to study pr uh, principally. Um, but it's always seemed to me that one of the reasons we admire Bach's ability to do certain things is that we've decided that those things are really important in themselves. They have a kind of implicit value. One of the reasons we have those values, contrapuntal, craft, um, certain ways of setting text and so on, is that Bach did them. And Bach, for various historical and partly accidental reasons, got promoted to the center of the study of music and, and at some crucial times. We've decided that those are important because Bach did them. And this feeds itself, and this is a kind of feedback loop, right? So Bach looks better and better the more we valorize, the more we value the kind of things Bach did, did um, really well. People have come to identify musically and religiously with Bach. And so to the extent that for many people, faith is participatory, um, there's a faith aspect um, to, I think, people's desire to be part of the production of this of this music. Um, there are many aspects of Bach's music that we value, especially say it's contrapuntal complexity, that unless you are a very skilled keyboard player, you can't really be a part of, right? Yeah. Um, but you can be part of some of Bach's most intricate contrapuntal writing if you are singing one of the lines of a, of a contrapuntal chorus. I mean, there's just all kinds of reasons why people gravitate to the, this music and wanting to participate in it. Um, uh, I mean, there's, there's more to say on, on that, but, but the, more you val the more you value these things, the better Bach looks. But one of the reasons we value them is that Bach did them and we were brought up on Bach. <laughs> and, you know, Joshua, if it comes right down to it, if the performance choices that I would favor for my own listening, for my own yeah. edification, aren't necessarily, um, you know, I, I don't want, while I don't condemn like the idea of do doing large scale things with modern instruments, it's not what I would personally choose. But one of the discussions I have a lot at, at the conservatory is, um, well, but I wanna play this music too. It, is my Steinway D not the right thing? Or, but, but I have this oboe and I, I'm not allowed to play that oboe. So can't I still play Bach? And the answer is always, of course you can. It's just, and I'm not saying that you're saying that. Um, it's just, it's, it, again, it just comes down to what is the claim? Very much so, very much so. And as you say, honesty, uh, that's, uh, you know, I'm not, I'm not one who likes to make ethical pronouncements, but if I do, it's going to be that. Be honest about what you do. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think people should play Bach or any music they love, any way they love, of course. And whether that's for any of us, that's another matter. But, 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 but certainly there's no rigid standard, there are no absolute rules here. Um, I was looking through the questions that people submitted in various ways, and, and I see a couple I, I would love for us to talk a little bit hmm. about. Um, uh, one, this is from Jeffrey Burgess, in fact, um, is wondering about the modern orchestral practice and the way it affects the way we think about this music. So he, he writes, um, what's the lute player to do? Hang around for the rest of the work? We're talking about the only place that Lute participates in 1724, but talked to Manazil. We imagine that Bach's lutenist may have played another instrument or instruments or other movements in the Passion. Um, we know that Bach's first oboist was also a lutenist. 
Well, there's any number of, of aspects of modern performance, um, Jeffrey's right, that affect the way we think about this. If you're thinking about paying people, um, it does seem in some sense potentially wasteful or at least luxurious to pay a, a lutenist um, to come and play one short movement and then leave. Um, because that's the way we structure things now. People are specialists in that way. Um, and you're less likely to hire somebody um, who is gonna play oboe and other movements and lute for you in, in that movement. I mean, I'm sure there are people who can in fact do that, but the whole structure is set up in a way that assumes that people are specialists. I mean, keep in mind that under you know, typical union contract rules, you get a doubling fee if you pay more, play more than one instrument. It's something special for which you deserve, deserve compensation under employment rules. But there's lots of other ways that, that modern perspectives affect us. I see this all the time in, in teaching about box uh, original performing materials um, to students in a school of music. And we look at woodwind parts, and I'll show an oboe part of the kind we were looking at, and say, how many people do you think played from this oboe one part? And the universal answer was, well, one. Yeah. But then we'll get to a violin one part, and how many people do you think play from this? And not quite unanimously, but very often people will say two. And I'll say, why do you think that? And the answer turns out to be modern stand partner practice of you know two violinists playing from one part. It turns out that if you do the same kind of sort of reverse engineering of box string parts, you come to the, quickly to the conclusion that they are designed uh, much more likely to be, have been used by one person each than two. But once again, our starting point for this is modern practice. Um, only one, I mean, typically only one wind player, uh, concert bands perhaps aside with, you know, 20 clarinets or something in a section. But orchestral practice is that each woodwind player is going to have his or her own part. Um, ask any woodwind player you know about the concept of stand partner and they have no idea what, they're, what you're talking about, right? But violinists assume they're going to have a stand partner. And a, and this so is way, if you look at the last thing, if you if you look at the language used in um, editions, including the new Bach edition, um, every time there's a footnote about scoring, it talks about what happens at the first desk of violins and what happens at the second desk of violins, just because that's our framework. We're flatlanders and we don't imagine that there's a third dimension out there. It, it, even, it even gets into the critical reports, these supposedly objective models of scholarship all make all of these assumptions. I just want to add to this that in fact this is um, a view of modern practice that is thoroughly inaccurate. What does the um, tenor horn player in Mahler's Seventh Symphony do? He plays at the beginning or she plays at the beginning, plays a little bit more in the development section of the first movement, and that's the end of it. What does the piccolo player in Beethoven's fifth do? You know, they're sitting around all of this time. Um, you know, you can, you can multiply the examples of this in the modern orchestral repertory endlessly. So this is like fake news, I hate to say it. It's, it's a kind of um, idealized version of modern practice, which does not even conform to modern practice, and then is used as a club with which to hit, 18, uh, you know, investigations of 18th century practice. Sorry, Jeff, if that sounds a little bit too apodictic, I do apologize. No, I think it's a. These are these are good questions, and they're very good questions. Every time, every time you you um, try to take a step back, you you are made aware of more and more assumptions that we naturally make about how music was made because that's how we do things. Why do we do things that way? Well, because that's, I mean, that's how we do things. Why so do this, relates, um, this relates to uh, one aspect that earned a lot of attention, um, particularly at the end of uh, Joshua's talk, um, but then also in emails um, about rehearsal process. And can maybe speak a little bit of, um, maybe we can spend a little more time than those couple of minutes we spent earlier about how we, how we can deduce rehearsal process, how that might relate to, um, this flows into questions we got about the skill of these musicians, because um, people have inferred from this, these talks that there wasn't much rehearsal. So um, what does that say about the skill uh, of these singers, especially some of whom were, were teenagers? Um, so if we could uh, it, maybe talk about that a little bit. Well, you go into any um, English cathedral choir these days, well, certainly the big establishment like King's, Cambridge, etc. 
these kids can sight read anything, you know, they do it flawlessly. Um, there are lots of examples like that. Um, I like to think when people say, you know, the kids at the Toma Shula, you know, how good they could have been. Well, look at your, look at your high school swing band or rock band. You know, look at the level of virtuosity that's out there. I'm not saying that the kids at the Toma Shula were like that, but how do we know that they weren't? Um, so I think the notation, and, and remember I stress again, this, this is not just Bach's notation, it's everybody's notation, presupposes a very high level of, you know, prima vista skill, um, which of course we also have in studio musicians and many other places this very day. Yeah, go, go watch the documentary sometime on the Wrecking Crew, the Hollywood-based studio musicians who were behind so many of the, um, of the most famous popular music recordings from the 60s and 70s, mid 60s to 70s, and um, read about the conditions under which they worked, walk in a couple of takes, a song is done and in the can, something they've never seen before, and then you move on to the next song, and a three hour session is enough to produce three or four um, songs that can be released on record for stuff that, whose arrangements they're making up on the spot and they, they've never seen before. They've just walked in off the street after breakfast. But when they leave too, like box musicians, they just nailed everything right away. You know? Why? Because they, they, li they live in these musical styles. And these pieces are, so many of these pieces are put together in, um, patterned way, I won't, I won't say formulaic, but there are so many elements that, um, that are, are givens as the starting point for an aria, say, of the kind you'd find in the same Matthew Passion, that we're not dealing with the reinvention of musical language or expressive devices or expressive tools or conventions of text setting. It's small variations, brilliant and insightful variations on the composing parts on, uh, on the on, on for what you might call formulas. And they say, oh, I know what this is. I mean, uh, and can just, and can keep going, right? And Joshua, when you came in and worked with the cantatas class at NEC, you pointed out to the students as we were sitting there, if you have a relatively small group as the one part per person ideas, it's, it becomes more like chamber music. And everybody who was playing this music was a native speaker of that language. Sure music and where you got hung up, you could probably make your way through. You could figure it out because of these patterns, because of these forms, because you had played with these people every day of your life for years on end. Well, so modern parts still have lots of mistakes, you know, not printed ones, but also manuscript parts. We don't have that many of them, but you know, hand prepared parts done up on finale for the session. They have mistakes. People live with them. People correct them. Uh, I admit that there are some really horrific ones, but again, I think we overdo the level of how inaccurate the music is. I think that's a, that's a tradition we've come to because we don't see that many dynamic markings. We don't see, you know, espressis, or we don't see the kind of markings that we know from the later 19th century that to us mean musical specificity and notation. So there are a couple questions, um, maybe shifting gears a little bit about, we, we talked a lot about how we hear the passions um, now and how we approach them as performers now, but there are several questions in the, um, uh, the, the theme of how they were heard um, in this Nikolai Kirka or, or wherever. Um, one uh, question from uh, the musicologist, Barbara Hayhulo is asking about um, how the St. John Passion fits into the tradition of passion performances at, in Leipzig. Um, and she says her main question is, what can we assume singers or the congregation knew, and how would that explain omitted or included information in the parts that we have? Um, so I want to speak a little, and, and just generally fitting the St. John Passion into um, how people heard passions at, in Leipzig. When um. Well, to start with, um, they didn't have a, a long history of, of experience with this because the concerted passion of the type represented by Bach's St. John and St. Matthew passion was a really a very recent introduction into Leipzig liturgy. It was a musically, it was a theologically musically conservative place. Um, and so it really isn't until 1720, 1721, I think, that um, you start getting 
Concerted Passion, performed by Bach's predecessor as city music director and Thomas Gunter, Johann Kuna. And so it was a relatively newfangled thing um, for them. And newfangled things always present problems and challenges for a lot of listeners. Um, but they didn't have a lot of context, um, a, a lot of context for this particular kind of passion. Um, narrative musical presentations of the passion story were had been part of Lutheran musical life since the early years of the Reformation, um, but in a much, musically much simpler ways, focused on the quasi recitational presentation of the gospel narrative by an evangelist um, and the participation perhaps of another singer who sang Jesus um, and a small ensemble who sang words of, you know, words of groups. Uh, that was a pretty typical kind of uh, passion performance. But if you're talking about the kind that drew on modern operatic textual and musical types and um, affective musical settings of those interpolated commentary movements, that was, that was pretty new. Um, that was pretty new for Leipzig. And Bach is writing this. And if you look at Hamburg, the other most comparable Lutheran German city, um, where uh, um, Bach's colleague Georg Philipp Telemann took over essentially the parallel job to Bach just one year before Bach started in Leipzig, you can see, you can actually tell that the passion tradition in Hamburg um, until Telemann arrived consisted mostly of musically much simpler sorts of pieces. And it's Telemann who begins almost at the same time that Bach does presenting this, this kind of piece. The pieces were shorter, but they worked in, in precisely the same uh, musical and textual ways. Uh, this was relatively new, even in a musically ambitious place like, like Hamburg. There are older examples and they did get performed on occasion, but as the principal music in, in a in big city, it really was new both to Leipzig and to, and to Hamburg, stri strikingly enough. So of, of, um, I'm actually surprised this only got asked once in the chat box, but I think it's a widely known um, question surrounding the performance of Bach's Passions. Um, so the concerted music is new, but of course within that concerted music are embedded these familiar and well-known chorales. Um, and there's a, there's a performance tradition very much alive and very much um, accepted that those were sung congregationally um, in Bach's performance. Uh, so I wonder if there could, we could hear your thoughts on that issue. Joshua? Um, it is a very noble tradition in Bach performance since the 19th century. Um, I think I will even say that there is some evidence of certain concerted music at certain places um, with congregational participation in chorales. However, there is a zero evidence for it in Leipzig. I think I think that's correct. Is that is that so? No, I do not know of it. No evidence for it. Secondly, um, if you look at the music itself, let me put this as cautiously as I can, um, the difficulty and intricacy of Bach's settings, which also affect the melodic line, not just the harmonies, um, would I think make you think that you want some very powerful evidence for audience partition, sorry, congregational participation before you assume it happened. Um, this is another performing practice that clearly varied from place to place. And once again, Hamburg makes a really good comparison. If you look at the printed librettos of, say, Telemann's Passions, um, you know, parallel to, to Bach's, um, when they come to a chorale, interpolated chorale, like the ones in the St. John and St. Matthew Passion, they provide the page number and hymn number and stanza number in the standard Hamburg hymnal of the time. With the clear, I mean, partly so they don't have to print the whole text, but another clear possible interpretation is so that you could turn to it and you could, that you could sing a lot. We don't know for certain, but that does seem to be, seem to be plausible. Um, interestingly enough, when Telemann dies and his successor is appointed, uh, his godson, uh, Carl Philipp Emanuel Bach, J.S. Bach's second oldest son, um, C.P. Bach inherits the responsibility for putting on passion music. And the first passion he puts on, 1769, if I remember the date right, is um, a reworked version of his father, St. Matthew Passion, in a version greatly shortened, 
uh, because he only had an hour and the way the Hamburg liturgy was set up. And he turned it into a single chorus piece rather than a double chorus piece. But it's really interesting on the title page of that, the opening page of that, there's a note that translates as, the congregation is kindly requested not to sing along in the chorales. And there's two interesting potential implications for that. One, of course, is that their usual practice was to do this. And the new music director said, no, I don't want you to do it. And the other is that Philip Emmanuel might be well be doing that, changing that practice uh, on the recognition of precisely the feature that Joshua just mentioned musically about his father's chorale harmonizations, is that they're not net really designed for congregational um, sing-along. So it seems to me that that had be, probably had been the practice by various pieces of evidence in Hamburg, but that doesn't mean it was done in Leipzig and in the absence, as Joshua says, of any evidence that it was, I would be very hesitant to, to assume it. Now there's ways you can interpret uh, symbolically the role of chorales as involving the con congregation in several ways. They're familiar, presumably from childhood, you can sing along in your head, you can anticipate the tunes um, and so on. There's all kinds of ways in which they might symbolically draw the, and, uh, draw the listeners and members of the congregation into the passion story, which is part of what these are designed to do, even without postulating that they are, sing they are attempting to sing along. Well, this relates to the point that Ellen made earlier also about when you perform the passions with what appear to be Bach's forces, they become very different and they become a sort of community that's assuming many different roles. And one of the roles that this much more flexible gathering of people assumes is that of a congregation. It moves from, you know, from this to that, the other. One might also mention that, of course, to us, box chorale settings are the model of chorale settings, but actually they, they really are very unusual at the time. Most chorale settings are dead simple and in that way, indeed, suited to congregational use. Yeah, you look at the ones in the Hamburg hymnal, Telemann's hymnal, for example, um, they're often just blamelessly homophonic, um, just note against note to present the harmony, implied harmonies in four parts and be done with it. And they're much better suited to congregational singing or accompanying congregational singing from a keyboard instrument. That's not really, I mean, especially if you look, I showed you the side by side, the chorale number five from the St. John Passion and Will Gesheha Gott zu Gleich. Um, it's hard to imagine Bach would intensify the sort of musical expressivity of that piece in revising it as he recopies in 1739, if he's thinking, oh, the congregation will get even more involved in this now that this piece has become more expressive and more dissonant and, and so on. It just, it doesn't, it doesn't once again, look most likely that that's what the design was. And all we can do in all these cases, because we weren't there, is try to re-engineer this. What seems to have been the, the thinking behind, behind doing these things? Um, there's one, uh practical issue that actually uh, earned has earned a lot of attention and i'm gonna i believe adrian butterfield was the first one to ask about it so i'm going to read his the way he phrased it he said um he asked i'm interested to know what evidence there is for falsettists singing alto and box choir uh, as well as unbroken boys voices and others have kind of added to that just wondering um about this issue of the boys and also um fatigue um, that may have said it and so forth um, and then how we rank how how you as modern performers today wrangle with this issue without the same what really is an un um, an irreplaceable or irreplicatable uh, it or historical can I, can I take first crack at that Dad and Helen um, and by the way hello to Adrian Butterfield um, the evidence is, strictly speaking, a bit ambiguous, I think. We don't really know much about the personnel, certainly in Bach's Leipzig uh, churches, particularly the singers. Um, but two things strike me. First is, as I mentioned, the boys at the Tomaschule actually go up to an age well past their voices breaking, even if one allows that voices broke at a later age than they tend to nowadays. 
Related to that is the picture we get from court chapels. And there we have a great deal of evidence from the personnel. And it is absolutely uniform, so far as I know, throughout the 17th and early 18th centuries. And that is that the standard lineup is a boy on the top voice, but grown men from the alto on down. Now, whether, so, so whether they sang in what we would call falsetto or very high tenors, I mean, Andrew Parrott and I go back and forth on this one all the time, but I think that in some version of a grown man's voice seems to have been the standard model. And so far as I can tell, the personnel of the Leipzig churches would have accommodated that. The boy alto um, seems, from what I can gather, to be largely a later invention. But perhaps Daniel and Ellen know more to contribute on that. Um, a little bit. Um, a, a former student of mine did a real, who was a, a tenor with a voice well suited to singing the evangel Bach evangelist parts, got really interested in the question of whether in singing Bach tenor parts, tenors in Bach time were likely to have themselves to have used falsetto. And the perspective he ended up with, which I found really interesting, is that um, the idea of falsetto as a separate kind of voice, as something distinct, you can argue is a, as a modern invention. It's a modern labeling of a particular way of producing sound. And um, it's all, it's tied up in really interesting ways. And there's been lots of interesting work um, on this recently with ideas about masculinity and what sort of sound ought to come out of a male body and so on. Um, but just from the point of view of vocal pedagogy and, and vocal practice, um, the idea is that there are some men who sing in falsetto and some who sing in head voice and some who sing in chest voice seems to be a modern way of thinking about it. And there's every reason to think that, in fact, before those distinctions were being made, it's not that they didn't know different ways to produce vocal sound, but before those, dis those different ways of producing had names and were considered distinct, that singers probably made use of all of them, including tenors, you know, either flipping into another sort of voice or learning to be fairly seamless about going through the various, what we now think of as different ways of of producing. And so um, you have to be careful in talking about these things, once again, is to ask, are we talking about this in, in modern terms? Are we talking about this in modern vocal pedagogical terms, which work great for us and provide a framework for teaching voice and teaching singing and thinking about these things, but don't necessarily represent um, 18th century thinking and um, 18th century practice. Uh, we do have references in the the few documents that come down about this from the, you know, from Bach's time in Leipzig is that, yeah, it was clearly recognized that at some point a boy's voice would change and no longer be usable as a, as a soprano. Uh, there's even a mention, one of the few little biographical details we know about J.S. Bach is the moment at which, um, at least according to the, the family story, his voice changed and he spent a week speaking in octaves and then he lost his, he lost his soprano. So they, I mean, they knew about, about that. Um, but it's also quite clear that people were then able to, I mean, men were then, young men were able to transfer their skills at singing that they had used in the soprano range into other ways of singing in what we would call chest, chest voice or at voice or what we now think of as, uh, as falsetto. Once again, there's a danger of thinking, talking about this in a, fr from modern, um, modern points of view in ways that don't quite get to the nature of the 18th century issue. But to, but to bring it back around to Adrian Butterfield's original question, um, specifically with the alto, I seem to recall, I think it might be in Weimar, but I'd have to look up this document, try to find it. But there is a, an instance of a choir boy, in other words, a boy soprano, a discountist, whose voice broke and then turns up as an alto. But that's an indication that the alto is not a boy's voice, but an adult singer's voice. Right, it seems to me that the the altos who sang for Bach, whom we know by name, are all adults. People like, what, Wendling? Is that, did I have the name right? Veldish. 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 Weimar, yeah. Yeah. Um, Weimar is a typical case. The chapel consists of men, alto, tenor, bass, and then discountists who are often even separately on the books. They have a different sort of rubric under which they come. 
Right, because their status is often different. They're not they're not court employees in the same quite the same way because they might come out of the school system or the yeah. church church school system. That's right, and that that was pretty common. That was the practice once again in Telemann and CPA Box Hamburg worked work the same way. The standing roster of paid professional singers, alto, tenor, basses, were adults, um, uh -huh. and that the soprano roles were sung by you know, church school, music, church music school boys, right? fire school boys. The, if, if, interestingly, it may be the case, I mean, here's where I'm going to be very speculative, that the boy alto is a creation of more modern times after it became more common to use women on upper voices. For example, I do know that in, um, in, in the Eisenach, uh, Church, oh no, Eisenstadt, where Haydn's late masses were done, um, the ensemble consisted of two women sopranos, two women altos, two tenors, two basses. And I suspect that if one really did more work on this, one will see a shift to using women's voices, but on both upper parts. And I think that then transfers back to the so-called boys' choir, which is really the voice choir that we know, like the uh, Kreuzchor in Dresden and so forth, is a romantic era invention. So we should, pro I mean, I think we probably have something of an obligation to talk just for a couple of minutes about what do we do now <laughs> about boy sopranos, women sopranos, uh, adult male alto singers, women. Uh, that came up in a way. That came up in the questions, right? Um, How we so hear. What do we do? <laughs> um, well, again, if I may speak from my own choices, um, look, we don't have the Bach boy soprano uh, because their they, 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 their voices broke much later. Secondly, I think more important, the evidence is that um, the use of boys rather than women or falsettists. Um, really was an institutional thing. There, there is no evidence that I can see that it's a musical matter. I mean, there's a sort of nimbus around boy sopranos nowadays, but that I think is, again, something that didn't exist back then. Um, we know that we, we, we have enough, I think, examples in Bach of where he had exactly the same music sung by a boy soprano and by a male falsettist soprano in the Collegium Musicum. Um, and I think there are even some reasons to suspect a woman every now and then. And women certainly did sing in some churches in Germany, the soprano part. Um, the way I like to look at it is that the difference for Bach between a boy soprano, an adult falsettist, and a woman was like the difference between an oboe by Perschmann, an oboe by Denner, and an oboe by, Eich and an oboe by Eichentopf. You know, they're different brands of the same instrument, and it's not that crucial which one you're using, not from musical points of view. No. Um, that, that may be, uh, you didn't go fully down this road, but in asking what the reason was that Bach was using all male singers in this way, the next step on that is to say, well, he only did it because he had to, what he really wanted and the better musical results would have come from, and we've already talked about the, the um, the the the, foul, the historical fallacy of trying to make arguments like that. Uh, there are perfectly good modern arguments um, for uh, uh, using uh, using um, women singers uh, in performing uh, this music. I mean, one of them is made on occasion to me by my wife, who was a mezzo soprano, who you know occasionally points out that all these terrifically talented male altos are. You know, are you know, pushing mezzos out of, out of work who, and altos who might be singing, female altos who might be, you know, getting gigs doing this, this music. I mean, it is, a, it is a consideration, right? Well, I always used male altos and I made a point of it, but you know, it's still to this day very hard to find many who really can cut these parts really, really well. Mm -hmm. um, and when I was doing more of it, it was even more so the case. And I remember an occasion early in this century in, in Norway, I think it was, when um, they had got the singers of the uh, Norwegian Baroque Orchestra, and there was a fantastic um, Norwegian mezzo who sang. And, I, and, and I, I worked with her and I said, oh my God, you know, she's so fantastic. I'm gonna use her for, you know, from, from, from now on. And I've generally, in fact, had um, women mezzos since 
since then. Mm -hmm. I mean, they know how to sing and produce a sound very much like a male alto. They, they can do that. So, um, you know, if you're concerned about the tone quality and the agility and all of that, you can do that. Yeah. And if we go back to our pedagogical reasons for wanting to make this music participatory for students in colleges and universities and schools of music, I'm certainly not as director going to tell all the female students or half of them to go find something else to do while the boys get to sing Bach. I mean, it's just, that would be entirely contradictory to the, the purpose of that sort of. Here's a quick uh, follow up uh, historical question on this from Jude Ziliak, who asks if uh, castrati were cultivated in Germany at this time. Well, for Italian style opera and Catholic court music, maybe, but certainly not in the St. Thomas or the St. Nicholas churches. In Dresden, definitely. Yeah, big Catholic court church with a big Italian and opera establishment, sure. But it, yeah, it's not, a, it's not a part of early 18th century Lutheran practice, it just doesn't, doesn't seem to be. But again, that seems to be institutional and perhaps, you know, ethical, et cetera, but not musical. Can we, um, there's a, another a question that came in that's related to the, the gender of singers. Um, it was about, what is it from? Um, a continuation of this line of thinking as how this, how this music would have been perceived by the original audience if the female roles, AKA my eight or pilot's wife would have been performed by male singers. Does this point further the argument that this was storytelling and not sacred drama? There's all sorts of pathways like what, Again, it's not a visual presentation of a drama. It's not a character is, um, a, 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 a part is not a particular um, stage actor. It but it's very, an interesting that's question. A modern question, because after all, um, as everybody knows, Shakespeare's women's roles were played by boys and they are dramas and they are representing characters. So perhaps this whole manner of thinking um, is, is, is projecting certain modern understandings of gender roles onto a different period. Not, not that gender is unimportant there either, but it may have to be seen from a slightly different perspective. Yeah, yeah I, I, would, I would agree with, with both those points. It's, not, it's certainly not visual. And the convention was so well established that if you switch to soprano range, and the libretto says this is a female character speaking. Th that's good enough for the, that's good enough for the purpose. It's understood that this is a musical representation, uh, a, a conventional musical representation of a of a female character. Um, I don't think I know of any passion settings that use anything but soprano range for a character who is explicitly female, Mary. The maid, pilot's wife, mm -hmm. nor can I think of any female characters who are anything, anything else. Mm -hmm. So it, this is, this is a convention that people just accepted probably without thinking about. We live in an age in which um, sex and gender and its meanings and the way it plays out in society is very important for all kinds of, all kinds of reasons. This, in, in this regard, in this particular issue, it does not seem to have been a... In know, fact, I suspect yeah. if one went back through the Bach literature, one would find that this question was not raised until maybe at most 30 years ago. Maybe. Um, also, there's a so-called secular, there's a secular cantata in honor of the Queen of Saxony, um, one of the pieces from which Bach ended up reusing a lot of music for the Christmas Oratorio, um, most of whose, it's like a four principal named characters, yeah. and three of them are female oh. in persona, sung by a soprano alto tenor, yeah. but they're understood to be female characters, um, uh, demigods and deities and, and so on. Um, it's it's just part of the the convention that you simply label these people by what they what what their dramatic role is their narrative role is and you just go go from there without being as concerned about it it's got all kinds of interesting ramifications now that we think about these things 
Uh, for different. what it's worth, they don't have basses singing the female roles, except there's a very interesting cantata by a minor composer in Darmstadt, which is sung by a bass, but at certain points he impersonates Maria Teresa, and then he goes into falsetto for her. Um, we're getting to our closing time, and there's a very interesting historiographical question um, from Annette Richter that might be a nice um, kind of postlude to these discussions. And, and she asked, um, I'm wondering if you might be able to comment on the question of accessibility of the sources for the St. John Passion at the Staatsbibliothek Preußische Kulturbesitz in Berlin at the time when scholars from outside Germany began working with these sources. Uh, did the division of Berlin into East and West play a role? And if so, did it facilitate or make more difficult the access to these sources? Did you work there in the uh, before the vendor? Sorry? Did you work there in Berlin before the before the vendor? Before the wall came down, yes, I did, uh, on both sides. Okay. I have to say that for the most part, if you're talking about the sources that were in the Berlin library at the time of the Second World War and that got uh, stored away for safekeeping and then found their way back eventually into uh, libraries on either side of the Berlin Wall. I have to say that for the most part, um, access to those sources, certainly for Western-based scholars, um, libraries in, on both sides, access was good. You could get films from, from either microfilms from either place. Uh, the films that came from the West were much better quality than the films that came from the East, but they were often, let's say, often usable. Um, as a Western scholar, I had easy access to um, materials in the West, and uh, if you're willing to, you know, cross the cross the border um, to library in the East. Um, and so, my impression is that that um, didn't really hinder Western scholars. Eastern scholars had a more potentially more different, difficult time, those living, say, in East Germany, because their ability to travel to the West was completely, was completely limited, except in very special, special cases. Uh, they did eventually were able to get access to film, but it was, not, it was not easy. And it was only under the auspices of the official Bach Research Organization that you could be reasonably sure of getting access as an East German scholar um, to materials that were, were, held, were held in the West. That's right. They were allowed out under special circumstances. Schultz, uh, Hans Joachim Schultz in Leipzig did visit the West, but it was very strictly controlled. Um, I think for West Germans it was not a problem and other Europeans. Uh, there's one irony in this, that in fact it was for a while you had much better access to box sources in East Berlin than you did in West Berlin because there was a librarian in West Berlin who just would not let you see anything. He was the most charming guy under the sun, wonderful lunch companion, but you did not get to see sources. And in East Berlin, they were much more forthcoming about it. And in retrospect, I mean, I experienced that. And in retrospect, um, especially given the rapid rate of decay in these ancient sources, their physical condition, in a way, I mean, the, the West Berlin source uh, librarians were doing a better job preserving this material than the East German librarians who very generously just dropped this in, in front of you at a, a request. So I've, I've always been pulled in two different directions on this. Event. Librarians who, who are responsible as material have a, have a terrible pull. It pulls in two directions. On the one hand, they're the ones with trust and protect, entrusted with the protection of, of this material and its preservation um, potentially forever. On the other hand, librarians urgently want this stuff to be useful and usable and accessible to, to users. And th those are, are you know, conflicting, conflicting um, imperatives. The availability now of really high quality digital photographs of these at no continuing risk whatsoever to the physical condition of the sources is a gift, and here thinking of what's been collected on Bach de Gital, a, a gift of absolutely enormous magnitude. And Bach de Gital is an amazing collection, not just for the quality of the uh, photographs and the mostly usable interface, but also for the political work that had to be done to get so many libraries to collaborate and say, yeah, we're gonna make this stuff publicly available. Um, it, it really is, is astonishing. 
but it's one of the ways that librarians have now got to both preserve, be the stewards of this material and to give all of us access to it. I, I think, I mean, you, you're right. One cannot, you know, and, and we all complain about this or that about Bach Digital and its interface, etc. but, you know, there was the world before it and the world since. And in many ways, it's becoming absolutely unimaginable what it was like before. So I think the few of us who made the trans transition from one to the other, maybe the last generation who can sort of see that. But you know, that's great. I think that nobody in the future knows that difference would also be just fine. It's wonderful that it's there. Great. Well, we're approaching our 60 minutes, so I want to thank our uh, panelists, uh, Joshua, Daniel, and Ellen. Um, and I'm going to hand it over to our director of the CEMS, Victor Coelho, for our closing remarks. Oh, Victor, sorry, you're muted there. Thank you. Thank you to Dan and Ellen and Joshua, Brett. Um, this has really been a, a fascinating, fascinating discussion. As I think we can all see the issues and the conversations that we've been having apply even more broadly towards the performance and aesthetics of playing, um, of playing early music, not just to Bach, but in terms of how we look at sources, how we re-examine and re-examine sources um, and uh, continue this, um, this idea of how performance and, and scholarship are completely intertwined um, and are part of uh, this, the, same, the same type of scrutiny. So um, I wanted to mention, um, first of all, thank you to all the participants as well. I can see that we have still around 150 that are, that are out there and listening and um, writing to us. I can see the questions are still lining up. You do have emails of, of, the, um, of, the, particip of the panelists and they've um, very generously um, agreed to, to uh, answer emails of questions that you have, particularly um, those uh, those questions that are are really about some of the things that we discussed today, uh, for sure. This has been recorded, and uh, we will have a, um, a a digital copy available once it goes through the Boston University system and it's uh, been finalized. And Brett will be in touch about um, the availability. Uh, of that, uh, whether we it's posted or it becomes a YouTube, um, it's not, not quite clear to me. But that will that is imminent, um, and so those of you who missed parts of it, um, et cetera, can still uh, see the entire uh, um, video cast of this. Um, so in closing, thank you very much. This is the first I, I now can see of of uh, more uh, webinars from the Center for Early Music Studies, and I wish you all the best. Thank you very much.